What is going on, the Dolphin, everyone? did I not mention? He's a goddamn electro freak. You mean he lights up light bulbs? More like flash frying everything for a mile. Look, I know you've always been able to handle yourself, but this son of a bitch is on a whole other level. As a recent state of play, so Nintendo Direct, and then um, obviously we'll probably be touching on a little Bethesda stuff and talking about Jeff's relationship with the Elden Ring fan because it's it's quite hilarious. Jeff, how are you doing this fine Saturday morning, my man? I'm, I'm doing good. It's uh, nice and sunny out. There's uh, still snow. I think I'm going to take my kids sledding later, but I'm, I'm doing good. I'm ready to talk about some video games. Awesome. I'm excited to have you on. You know, we've... I was talking to you about this before we went live, but there's been a, a contingent of people in the uh, live chat spamming uh, Oh Elden Ring for the past 24 hours or so. So, uh, should be a good show. I'm excited to get into it. Uh, shout out to 75 people already. New on the show every Saturday. All the people the dark. You know, anger from certain people is uh, the interview that Jim Ryan had with GQ about the future of PlayStation, uh, a new PSVR headset, and turn that right on. We're getting it, fixing it. Okay, good catch. Sorry, guys. Apologize. Game audio is off now. Um, so let me back up here. Let me back up a sec because maybe that was blasting people's ears off. Yeah. Um, what's up, everyone? This is Miles with Windows Central Gaming. And today we are joined by Jeff Grubb um, of GamesBeat to talk about PlayStation games on PC, uh, State of Play, Pokemon Direct, and Jeff's relationship with the Elden Ring fandom. Um, so again, I'll, I'll kick it over to you because the game might have been blasting, but um, how you doing? How you doing on this fine yeah, Saturday? Yeah, good. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have the chat. It, you know, it's, uh, I, you know, it's cool to do a Saturday morning podcast. It feels like we don't have to worry about. There's nothing else happening. Everyone already announced all the news. We could just chill and talk about video games in a, in a fun way. So that's that's cool. Exactly. The week has happened. We've had some time yeah. to digest everything that's going on. And then, you know, it's like Saturday morning cartoons, just hanging out with the squad, talking about video games. Um, mm -hmm. so Although Saturday morning cartoons don't exist anymore. So, yeah, that's that's one weird thing about life. It's net Netflix killed those. Yeah. So rest in life peace. Changes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll replace it. Kids get around the TV and come watch us. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the vibe. here. That's all the all the kids in their uh, late 20s, early 30s can tune <laughs> But um, yeah, no, I'm stoked to have you on. Um, obviously, the big news this week has kind of been the interview Jim Ryan did with GQ about the future of PlayStation, a new PSVR headset, and basically PlayStation exclusives coming to PC in some capacity. So there was a lot of really good information in that article, and there was a lot of information that um, I guess a lot of diehard Sony fans kind of saw as almost a betrayal of their uh, relationship. And you had an, a hilariously titled article basically saying PlayStation owners can no longer uh, fulfill uh, Sony's needs, which, which kind of touches on it perfectly. As funny as that headline is, there is a very strange relationship that PlayStation has with its fans. And the reception mm -hmm. to the whole PlayStation games coming to PC thing paints a really clear picture of that. So what are your general thoughts on... PlayStation's future f with PC games specifically. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think we're going to get a lot more of those games on PC. I think they they're, they're starting with the ones they think uh, will have the that will do best or they'll do best by these games by putting them on PC first. So uh, I think the games that, you know, maybe came out and were trying to get a footing, uh, you know, Horizon was very successful. What, what's the name of the second game they're putting out? I can't, it slipped my mind. Uh, oh, they, I want to call it. They did uh, Death Stranding and Days Gone. Or days gone. Days is the one gone. I, I, I wanted to call it "Don't Cry" for some reason. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, days gone. Like that game's like, yeah, it's a new franchise. They spent a lot of money getting it set up, and it, you know, it did 
fine on PlayStation, but like, let's get it out on PC and let it, you know, make a big deal about PlayStation games coming to PC. We'll see if it can get a few million more sales if we're lucky. Um, and, 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 and that'll be great. And then later down the line, we'll probably continue doing this with the bigger and bigger and bigger titles. Uh, and it really just comes down to, yeah, like they spend a lot of money on these games. These games are very expensive to make. I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody. Um, you could see it on the screen when you play them. Everyone knows that The Last of Us Part Two was delayed multiple times, and it wasn't like it was cheap to make before those delays. It, it, but it, that the, that definitely amplified the cost uh, to the point where even if a game is, you know, getting up there near 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 a billion dollars in sales, uh, like yeah, that's that's awesome, and that that would make the game profitable. Uh, but it's it's gonna make it it's gonna make it so that. Those profits don't look as strong as you maybe, you know, Jim Ryan would hope before he greenlit greenlit these projects. He's like, you know, here's the best case scenario. Here's what we really got. Um, well, if we release it on PC, we can get a lot closer to that best case scenario. So, I mean, what are what are the reasons against that? And, I, you know, I, you know that that title of my article, I think it is the is the one case against putting these games on PC where the, you, the Sony has built up a relationship with its fans and you know, that, that those, some of those fans treat that relationship as very almost intimate, like that we have um, an exclusive relationship with you, PlayStation and these games, we bought the console, we put a ring on it and now you're going to give us all the milk. Right. Uh, and just us. And uh, when, when Sony like looks around and says, well, we, you know, we can make more money elsewhere. I, they're going to feel a little bit like it's a betrayal. Um, and that is a little bit of Sony's own making to an extent, the way that they do talk about the way that they treat PlayStation and, and the way that they say, Oh, our exclusives are the most important thing. But yeah. They, they kind of made it a little bit that way, but really, it comes down to the gamers buying into that. You are still buying into marketing. And I, at a certain point for me, I always want to kind of put it on the people buying stuff to say, hey, everyone's always lying to you when they're trying to sell you something. They are always inflating how you're supposed to feel about that product so that you will feel like you have a relationship with it. So you'll spend more money on it than what it's worth. That is marketing 101. So you kind of have to have a responsibility here to say, this is just a company. I'm going to treat them that way and don't feel betrayed. And I, you know, to be fair, most PlayStation fans absolutely do feel that way. Most people were just fine that it's coming to PC, mm -hmm. and yeah. they're probably happy that more people are going to get a chance to play these games. So, absolutely, yeah, so to me, it's it's, it's a, just a no brainer move. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. All these companies try to put on this again facade. Maybe facade's a harsh word, but they do. They put on a facade that they are your buddy, they are your friend. They want you to yep. be invested in their platform and their ecosystem because. That way you will spend more money. And if it is this kind of intimate relationship as Sony has built up, you feel a, a stronger connection to that brand. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, these companies are not your friend. As much as I love Xbox, they are not driving me to the airport or, or calling to check in. Like they are not your friends. They, they're trying to make money. And, you know, yeah. that's a sinister way to look at it. But that's the reality of running a business on that scale. No matter what yeah. happens at the end of the day, they're trying to make money. Um, and there are some interesting points in Jim Ryan's interview that, that basically project their long-term plans. Um, they straight up, Jim Ryan says, they're trying to figure out a way to uh, respect the economics of game design in a, in a broader way. Yeah. And they are continuing to take mission steps to bring more games to PC. He is, he is telling fans what is going on from a business standpoint without saying it. They, they want to make more money from their games. They need to make more money from their games. As we've seen with... Uh, the recent news regarding Japan Studio, um, they were not making enough money. And because of that, they're winding down production mm. of that studio. So Sony is very invested and concerned about making money from these games. They put a ton of effort and a ton of production cost into pr producing really big, great games. And that's awesome. But if you're going to tie that to a s single, isolated, kind of, quite frankly, niche thing like console gaming, you're restricting a huge percentage of the potential revenue that you could make there. Um, and Sony is, it's, it's PlayStation is so important to Sony. Um, you know, everyone, everyone knows how, you know, Sony's been up and down, you know, as camera sales and TV sales go up and down, uh, you, you know, they get rid of their laptop division and stuff like that. Um, PlayStation has only grown and, and, and become a huge and important chunk of their, of their profitability. And so, you know, you're, you know, you guys are doing really good. Can you become more profitable? And Jim Ryan, of course, wants to become more profitable. So even if the games are technically breaking even and then starting to make a profit on, on PS5 and PS4, um, 
that's not going to stop them from wanting to look around. So it's like, oh, you know, again, it comes like, aren't we enough for you? Place, place, we spend so much money on you. And PlayStation fans spend a lot of money on those games. Uh, but, you know, you, we know we know what's possible if you look around and um, you see a company like Nintendo selling 30 million copies of a game. And no Sony first party game is doing that. Uh, they're, you know, they're, the, the Spider-Man gets to 20 million ish, maybe. And that's awesome. That's huge. But we know that like the like some fan bases are even more ravenous for for first party games. So uh, and and everyone is always just saying these Sony first party games are so good. You know, then why aren't they kind of selling as good as Nintendo? And maybe it's just because this audience isn't necessarily just on PlayStation. This audience is elsewhere. Let's just go put that game where they are. And, and one of those places is definitely PC. Exactly. And that's that's what it's all about. Um, yeah. yeah, Jim and Jim Ryan touched on the kind of. I guess, odd relationship that they have with their fans. It was very interesting to me to, to see the head of PlayStation basically talk about how they were afraid of an adverse reaction regarding bringing their exclusives to PC as one of the kind of deciding factors of whether or not they're going to do this. So they did it. Right. They started with their trial run of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn as like a first party coming to PC. Um, and they were concerned that there would be basically an, an uproar and a rage. And, you know, there's a vocal minor, mo, minority that obviously was upset. You saw the ridiculous videos of people smashing their PlayStation 4s and just screaming on Twitter about the, the betrayal and how Jim Ryan is a liar. And I mean, they can point to things like basically Jim Ryan saying we believe in generations. Like some people yeah. took that literally. And, you know, people were upset and felt kind of betrayed. By that by that news but the reality is if you want big playstation games of that caliber to continue and if you want playstation games to grow and evolve they really need to look at other options for bringing in more money at some point um and i think he made that clear and i think we're going to start seeing bigger playstation games come to pc much much sooner than we have already yeah i i, I agree that window's going to shrink i think um and it, it makes sense. I mean, I think Horizon Zero Dawn did okay on PC. I think it would have done better if it came out, you know, a year later uh, instead of three years later, whatever it was. So yeah, I think that window's going to shrink as well. And shout out to the 134 people joining us today. Um, yeah, if, if you're new, again, subscribe, smash like, all that other cliche YouTube stuff, and a super chat from Mr. Joanna Dark, who is the super chat MVP in here. Uh, I want to start mm -hmm. by saying thanks, Miles, for bringing these amazing guests on the show. Jeff, glad to see you on the show and enjoy your content. Thanks, Mr. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's really nice to say. Thank you. So do you ever think we will see a day with specific PlayStation exclusives launching day and date on PC? Uh, yes, any multiplayer game, I think to me, uh, it made me, okay, day and date, it seems so extreme right now because it's Sony, uh, but... It, I think that with the windows going to shrink, it'll shrink a ton there. Maybe it's like six months later. Maybe it's like, oh, a month later after we just get it set up on, on PlayStation. Now let's do the same launch on, on PC. Uh, but, you know, ideally, if it's a, if it's an online multiplayer game, like if they're going to do this, la the Last of Us multiplayer, um, I, I, which, you know, they are still doing, I guess. Uh, why wouldn't you just also do it free to play and then put it on both PC and PlayStation uh, and create the, the best potential for that game to succeed, the biggest potential for that game to reach an audience. Um, and if, if you're an online multiplayer game exclusive to one console, uh, I think we've seen that even if you aren't, even if you're like a bleeding edge, so stuff like that, um, it, it is difficult to succeed in that space. And yeah, I, I yes. I, so I think that, that that the window is going to shrink to such a point that they are looking at PC as one of the must-haves for an online multiplayer game. Now, you know, for these big single-party narrative games, um, maybe years and years down the line. Well, because well, like they're, they, yeah, they they do understand they need to take the sting out of this a little bit. And one of the talking points for those fans who call Jim Jim Ryan, you know, the betrayer right now is, oh well you know, this PC player is just port begging and they're going to have to wait three years. Ha ha ha. Uh, and eventually they'll get tired of that and they'll just keep, they'll go back to play their game. And then, you know, they'll slowly shrink that time to the point where, um, yeah, once those people are a little bit over it or they get girlfriends or whatever, they'll go ahead and start putting God of War three or whatever on PC at the same time. And I don't, I don't, I, to me, that makes sense. You want to get that, that big pop right out the gate. Um, it, it, or at the very least, it's like it is 
a year later and it does sort of the GTA thing where like GTA five hits, hits the consoles, the, the, you know, the Xbox 360 generation console, then it hits the next gen consoles and then it hits PC one year, one year, one year. So I, yeah, and, and that worked really well for them, kept the momentum going and maybe Sony looks at it that way. Um, but either way, it's, it's just going to get closer and closer to day and date for sure. I totally agree, especially when it comes to multiplayer. Um, as we've seen with a lot of big titles, the more people playing it, the more word of mouth there is and the more kind of just energy there is behind a game. And so if you open that pool to a wider audience, you're going to have more people playing it. And hopefully that's going to pull in even more people. Um, yep. There's there is a contingent of people who are still saying that Sony will never release their PS5 exclusives day and date on PC. And I think after this this recent interview, I think that's just completely untrue. Sony is obviously looking at the logistics of doing that. And to your point, I think, yeah, the single player narrative stuff that might be more staggered. We might see like yeah. a, a year later, six months later, but I do think down the road, yeah, we will see day and date for most of their releases. Um, again, you have people who are, you know, armchair devs talking about the the capabilities of the PS5 and how developers on PC right. they can't even do they couldn't even if they wanted to launch it day and date they they couldn't port it to PC because of the the technical capabilities of the PS5 and. Unless you have an engineering degree, a software engineering degree, or or actively a game Plus developer, experience, yeah, yeah, it, it's you, you can't fairly say that. It's we haven't seen anything so <laughs> far that's impossible that the PlayStation is doing or the Xbox Series X is doing. They have cool tech, and yeah, they're, and they're pushing some boundaries. But right now, we can't say that a PC dev cannot make this game on PC because of the the magic, the the, the secret sauce that's in the PS5 that everyone talks about. Yeah, I, 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 to me, it's it doesn't seem like it's the, um, the technical side of things. It's just the logistical side. It is, you look at how Naughty Dog made The Last of Us Part Two, and it's like, you know, they, they, they were making that for one console, and they still had to delay it a bunch of times just to get it right on one system. And if you throw in other platforms, that just complicates things. It's mm -hmm. going to push stuff back. And so uh, w w how does Sony deal with this logistical, you know, challenge? And I would imagine that their their solution to this would be let these studios that are making the biggest games continue to just make it for PlayStation first and then we'll figure out the port once it's launched and however long that port's port takes that'll be the gap really um and 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 that that just it, it's not about the the you know whatever's inside the PlayStation 5 and it's not, it's not even necessarily about um developers getting the most out of one system because they're working with just one system. Although I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it maybe factors into the decision a little bit. Um, but I think it's just about making sure that these people can ship a game and where really is that most important for them? It's still going to be on a PlayStation console. And then uh, if, if, if you want to bring in like a, you know, a support studio to handle the port, those studios are out there. Uh, they're very good these days. They they are, um, you know, if if one is busy, there is another one ready to go. And so, yeah, and, and you could almost even just build a studio and and within within PlayStation to handle that sort of thing, like the PC ports team, and they'll get a backlog. And so, yeah, they'll just kind of get to these games when they can. Uh, th there's a lot of solutions here, but I, I see logistical problems, and and that to me says, okay, maybe these games stay uh, exclusive to PlayStation for a little bit of time while they just let these studios handle that uh, first and then get it to PC. Yeah, I think we a lot of us kind of over, oversimplify what goes into a port and the actual yeah. logistics of publishing and porting for different so or hardware. Um, there, it, it is more complicated than, than it really seems. So yeah, there is going to be extra time involved with porting a game to a PC or another console. And so they do need to fact that, factor that in. And as we've mm -hmm. seen with a lot of, you know, bigger releases, this, especially when it comes to the AAA space, a lot of these publishers are very concerned about the amount of lead time they have before they do a release. And that's why we're, we're getting a ton of big games launching with roadmaps because you have a set number of years invested into it. And the publisher says, OK, we need to start recouping some money on this. I understand yeah. you guys need more time to fulfill your vision, but we're going to put it out and we're going to send a roadmap out to the community that lets them know like what they can look forward to with this game. Um, as Jim Ryan said in his interview, it's complicated. Making money on video games is yeah. complicated. That's why we have companies, you know, exploring loot boxes and season passes and all these other factors. Cause 
not every game is is Fortnite that's just pulling in tons and tons of money. And not every game is going to succeed being in a games as a service, as we've seen with Anthem as a prime example. Right. But everyone wants the piece of that pie, and everyone's trying to figure out how to put put out a game that scratches that itch while also opens up this basically unlimited pool for revenue. But it's hard. It's really hard to find that balance that yep. caters to the player, makes them feel good about the game, and brings in a ton of money. Um, and so that's why PlayStation more than ever is looking at PC and looking at other platforms um, as a way to pull in revenue. No, and it, it almost works backwards. That, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get a piece of that pie. Making those, those service games is difficult. But uh, uh, you, if, even if you're making a single player game, you're still competing against those games that take up everyone's time. So um, it's, it's not like you are avoiding that fight and be like, oh, well, you know, we're going to go make a single player game and now we're going to be just fine. So uh, you have to take those, the, the, the time that people are sinking into, into those games into consideration no matter what. Um, and then it just becomes about risk management. And uh, and really, that's what every everything that in that article, in that interview uh, from Jim Ryan was. It's basically risk management. It is, um, we are spending a lot of money on this stuff. And we have seen that payoff because um, technically we are a service company uh, at PlayStation. And even if you are buying our single player games, if you're doing that, um, on a PlayStation console, chances are you are also buying some other stuff in our store and we get a cut of that. Uh, or you're playing one of these free-to-play games and buying in- in-game purchases and we get a cut of that. Uh, or you have PS Plus and we have, we, of course, we get all of that. Um, it, it, so all of that stuff feeds into it and, and, and they get service money. Uh, so these games can be treated as loss leaders. But um, it, at a certain point, when you hear your games are uh, game of the year contenders every year, and you hear that, uh, oh, this is what video games should be, and the one company making games the way that I, that I envision they should be made, uh, shouldn't those games also be extremely profitable in the way that like a, an MCU movie is extremely profitable or whatever? Um, and I, I think Sony looks at you know the, the the black ink and the red ink on their on their ledger, and they see that. No. And so what can we do? What can we do there? And there are options available to available to them and they're taking them. So, yeah, it, it's interesting to see. And I guess it, I, I, if, I, if I had to like bet on this a few years ago, I would have said it's it probably is inevitable. Right. And now it's like, OK, yeah, we are here. Uh, that that hunch that I think a lot of people had is, is now coming to fruition. That's been the speculation for a while is yeah, that yeah. PlayStation at some point be, is trying to transition into more of a platform software company. Is traditionally a lot of people oh, look yeah. at PlayStation as a hardware company, um, right. but as we've seen with most of their divisions, that is not the case. PlayStation has shuttered most of their hardware divisions, and PlayStation is kind of like the last bastion of that. Obviously, they still make cameras; they have other, you know, st- streams of income when it comes to hardware. But they understand how the the market and the business is changing, and dedicated console hardware. As much as I'm a, a filthy console heathen for life. Um, I understand that it's it's niche and it's you know it's it's not going to be the way that everyone's it's not going to be the way that most people are playing games in ten years. Um, I'm very interested to see what ten years yeah. from now looks like because um, I don't want to say anything too radical, but there might be a time where there's just not a dedicated console. In, 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 yeah, it's, in a decade, it's hard to see how that's going to evolve. So yeah, no, I agree. It's it's going to like it's it's hard to imagine what ten years is going to look like. Absolutely. Uh, Super chat hype from Mr. Joanna Dark again. Uh, do you think Sony will eventually offer a more robust back compatibility solution with PS5 and bring at some point PS1, 2, and 3 titles? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I I don't know. I, I think that, the, you know, making a backward compatible uh, is a... It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, and it's something that they needed to be investing in for some time in order to, like get anywhere near what 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 xbox has and that that full breadth of support for uh to the point where now microsoft is just working on really cool features for backwards compatible stuff like fps boost um i and i don't know if jim ryan's when he's when he's you know looking at ways to maximize profitability if he sees the pathway if if, if through backward compatibility to get to a point where they are making a lot of money from that I i i think that they imagine um it would be better to just keep putting stuff on PlayStation now or find some other way to monetize that by uh, putting it in a service and treating it that way. Um, and, and, you know, again, 
we know Microsoft does do this by basically putting a lot of these games in Game Pass or, or, or something else so that, you know, you get the benefit of having uh, backwards compatibility while also maintaining a subscription. But again, we're talking about a large hump to get over uh, at the beginning by investing in, 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 you know, emulation software that you could control and feel good about and uh, and that is robust enough that most games will work. And I just don't, to me, it seems like Jim Ryan is not, is not interested in putting a team dedicated to that in the same way that Microsoft is. So uh, I guess I, I won't give up hope completely. I just, when I look at what he says and the way that he talks about old games, uh, I just don't think the interest is there for them. So, you know, uh, sorry, but probably not. I, I agree with you there. At this point, it's kind of like a, a lost cause. Um, they would have to invest so much time and energy and effort in, into basically retroactively adding these features. Uh, whereas Xbox One, as as many issues as that console had and that, that launch had, they were at least forward thinking with the possibilities of maintaining a library. And so because yeah. of that, it, it's easier for them to basically support backwards compatibility. They also have a dedicated backwards compatibility team, which is something that I don't believe Sony has. So Xbox no. takes that legacy very seriously, but also they have the software in place that makes that an easier possibility for them. Whereas Sony would have to go back and figure out uh, an emulation solution for that that runs on their current systems and then figure out a way to get all these games and licensing figured out as well. Um, so it's a bit and more. I think, I, I think Sony has fostered this audience, right? That is like, give me the next thing. Give me the next big thing that uh, that you've spent five years and uh, $150 million making and I'm going to play through it in a week and then I'm going to ask for the next thing. Um, and, and you know, when, you, when that's your audience, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put a lot of money into into backward compatibility because they, they are really just like looking for the next hype moment. They're looking for the next uh, big drop in the in the next state of play. Um, and that's where your focus should be. And it seems like that's where Sony's focus is. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a match made in heaven. Um, although, you know, when they're yelling about the state of play not being very good, maybe that, that it doesn't feel that way. Yeah, definitely. Definitely want to touch on the state of play a little bit because there was mm. uh, some funny, funny reactions to that because yeah. as... We're in the season right now where people are just desperate. People are really desperate for big news and they, they want it, they mm -hmm. crave it, and they start filling in the void. And it's fun. I'll, I'll get in the wild speculation. I'll go down the rabbit holes. I'll dive into some Silent Hill conspiracy theories. I'm on board. But at the same time, I have a realistic expectation of what is probably going to be presented versus what my wildest dreams are. And um, it's it's hard for certain people to separate that. So you have these ridiculous expectations you have people saying we're going to see elden ring at state of play because miles on twitter said that jeff and him are going to talk about elden ring this week and it's the same week of the state of play and i'm like please calm down please that's not that's mm -hmm. not how this works that's not how any of this <laughs> works i know you want it i get it i'm a big souls guy i want elden ring all right i i get it but no it, that's not that's not the reality of this at all i don't know yeah it, it's it's uh it, right and, and you know we are i know people are, are sick of it but we're still in the covid world uh and um you know that that is now more just one factor among many uh but it is still a big factor and it still makes things uh complicated people uh, you know companies that weren't ready to shift to work from home really still are dealing with those issues really are and it's i know like most of us, I think, have either figured that out or are just going into work and sucking it up and, and doing the thing that we have to do to survive. Um, uh, but not every single thing has worked out that way. So, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I would just... I would continue to say, hey, I, I know we feel like oh, like like Nintendo held back in, in 2020, so we'll definitely get a lot in 2021. And I still mostly feel that way. Um, but, but you just... You, you can't know for sure and and so i know we get our hype just sky skyrocketing and mostly i would just i would argue against the idea of uh, the like the hype industrial complex like i know that that plays well and, and people really like to see people like see an announcement and jump out of their chair and you know you know grab their hair and go whoa um i know i know yeah <laughs> i i know that 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 plays when I, I i enjoy seeing those reactions too because it's how i feel a lot of times um but i think we can't thrive on that that can't be our, our our business model almost we have to be a little bit more like 
okay, yeah, there was a lot of cool games here that maybe I'll play and maybe they'll be good and I'll kind of have to wait, wait and see and almost sort of just be happy with that, um, especially until we get in the other side of COVID. So, yeah. Exactly. I, the further we get into COVID, the more we really understand how hard it is for some developers and companies to transition to work from home. It seems like unless the game was really far along, especially the bigger companies and the bigger developers, there's way more moving pieces involved when it comes to transitioning an entire team. We're talking sometimes hundreds or thousands of people that they need to figure out how to do a work from home scenario. And simple things like, you know, calling your manager over to take a look at an animation, something that would maybe take, I don't know, five minutes. He comes over, reviews your animation, says, all right, cool, this looks good, let's tweak this, let's tweak this, let's tweak this. Now you have to render or figure out a way to schedule a time with this person to do a screen share and then, I don't know, maybe get notes back. Yeah. So something that took five minutes now maybe takes an hour, maybe takes a day. And there's a, all these little things are stacking up and it's, it's, it's adding development time. And, and, and Japanese studios just weren't built for this ever. They, they really just, um, a lot of that innovation in Japan uh, stopped in the 90s and that included, like they don't, put anything in the cloud like that just was not something people in japan ever talked about at, at japanese companies most japanese companies and so the idea now that you're going to work to a cloud-based infrastructure um that was a that's a, a real challenge to the point where it could still be hurting things now so mm -hmm. um a lot of japanese studios did figure it out but i, I mean if, if, if there's some we haven't heard from maybe I, I would still chalk it up to this stuff i really would absolutely yeah um couple super chats going to get to real quick here. Also, shout out to uh, homie Jez Corden chilling in the chat. Paris is in here. A lot of compliments on your hair, Jeff. So, yeah, that's, yeah. So you, let's you fluff it up a little bit. The, the let's oh, yeah. up the fans. Let's, let's get the, the, yeah. the boys out there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> got a little heat to this episode here. <laughs> yeah, a little, some white hairs in there. Yeah, some stress yeah. for my kid. All right, you can see that stuff. A little stuff. salt and the pepper Keo, there. The Keo Pro here it really shows it off. All right. <laughs> All right, so we have a super chat from Hunter Smith. It came out that Stadia canceled an episodic Kojima horror game. Does the statue next to the Xbox logo on Phil's desk make a bit more sense now? Yes, I forgot that we were going to talk about shelves as well. So I guess we can get into the, uh, the ongoing Xbox shelf conspiracy. What do yeah. you think about the, the Luden statue next to the Xbox symbol behind Phil during this interview? Anything to you? Does that does that tickle you at all? I'm trying to think how it's probably significant is how I'll say it. Um, yeah, probably significant. I, I would say that uh, uh, most of the stuff on the shelf is probably significant, actually, is how I would put it. And I, I'm like afraid to say much more than that. But yeah, there's uh, uh, I, I don't think Phil's trying to be too coy anymore. <laughs> he knows what people do when they look at his shelf and he's he's doing it deliberately um so uh does that mean something has happened for sure I, I don't think anything's happened i don't think they've like inked any deals uh necessarily with, with most of the stuff suggested by that shelf um but i think it's stuff that is that he's curious in in exploring in, like and in looking into more and making stuff happen um i i wonder though like personally i wonder like uh if, if you haven't inked those deals and you put that stuff up there and you get the speculation going, does that make it harder to sign? Like, doesn't that like get people amped up and say, look at the excitement. If we were to come to you and you know, if it's, if it is like the Kojima thing, like give us more money like, to do this. So, uh, uh, but I, I don't know. I, I wonder what like Phil's exact strategy is there. Uh, but yeah, I would say the shelf is significant. Is this exactly how I would put it at this point? Yeah. It's hard to not take, stuff on shelves of anyone from xbox now it's hard to just overlook it because we had the indiana <laughs> yeah. jones stuff we had the the series mm -hmm. s we had all the, the heads the new headset like in the video like there's all these things that they're just putting out there in the open but not touching on at all and so now it's gonna if they get to the point where they're just teasing us with shelves and nothing happens because of the memes it <laughs> it, 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 it would be pretty funny i would i would like it if there was just literally right. on that shelf nothing Nothing of significance on that shelf <laughs> at all, but they just want you to look at it. And there's all these like key things, but I agree. I think something on that shelf is probably pretty far along. Cause I feel like to your point, I don't think Phil's going to tease something that's not close. But I feel like that again, sets up this big expectation. 
And then Xbox has always had a problem with managing expectations. Uh, scale bound, talking about how it's going to be the most ambitious game ever made, and then that not coming out. Like once you start making those claims and once you start putting these ideas out into the world, it's hard to reel it in. And all you're doing is just creating a lot of kind of like positive or negative energy regarding this idea if it doesn't happen. But again, um, I would love if it was nothing at all, but I don't know. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, well, well, I, I'm like, try, I'm looking at a picture of it. I'm trying to see everything. What is the Ubisoft thing that people talk about? Uh, like, Isn't oh, it just the Watch Dogs up. Legion Collector's Edition? Isn't it? Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, it's just like the, yeah, the mask. Yeah, like that. Um, Ubisoft. There's, there's probably a deal happening with Ubisoft. I would imagine it's probably Ubisoft Plus coming to you know uh, Game Pass Ultimate. Uh, that would be my guess. You, be yeah, you my... play in Game Game Pass Ultimate is kind of the big speculation right now, and that's the big right. Yes, yeah. so I'm I am speculating like everyone else right there. But uh, like like I, I again, I don't think it's on there accidentally. Uh, like this is, uh, yeah, I, you know. Phil's also stuck at home a lot, or you know, I guess you know maybe this is his work office. I can't actually tell. Uh, but 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 you know, he, he, there's not a lot, like a lot of other people around. It's like you know they're not having a ton of in-person meetings where where they're going to be. Like, he's in his office a lot, so he's got time. He's going to like say, hey, I know what we're doing. I'm going to go just put. I'm going to go put stuff on my go shelf to mess adjust. with people. Yeah, his shelf is never yeah. the same. It's just like wouldn't little... you? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So if I, yeah, if, um, if I was in that position where people are looking at my shelves, yeah, I would totally tinker. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for, I, I don't know. It's it's fun. I, I I hope the next time like he does this though, there's just nothing on his shelf and people freak out like, mm -hmm. oh man, what's wrong with Phil? Oh, put God. something. Put yeah. pyramid head like right dead center. Like, yeah, <laughs> pyramid head right. That's the only thing. He clears his entire shelf. Puts a just, one pyramid head statue. Just a picture of Ken Kudaraki. What? What does this mean? What? Like yeah, and then nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. That would mm, mm, do it. Do it for the memes, Phil. Please, Phil. All right, uh, Gamer Nation with the first Elden Ring super chat. Uh, do you think we will get an announcement for Elden Ring a little while before the trailer is shown, or do you think the trailer will be a surprise drop? Not sure. Uh, not sure. And it's, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I will say that, like, I, I, my understanding is that, the, like, they were getting to a point like last year where things might have started happening, and and the fact that they haven't. Um, is I, I get that's why a lot of people are anxious and worried, and I, I, I and you know there's definitely something there, and I think this is one of the studios that was disrupted significantly by by COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, so them figuring out exactly how it's going to go down, uh, I, I don't know. Like there, there's not Microsoft probably doesn't have a, a major event that would be able to showcase this before E3. Um, so if they, they still have the Microsoft marketing deal. Uh, how do they do it? I, I would imagine you just have a big trailer drop, and that's that would be that would make the biggest splash. That would be my guess. Um, but I don't know. It, 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 like you never, you, every marketing team and every one of these publishing companies is different. So what does Bandai Namco think is best? Uh, I, I I have a hard time saying. I guess we could look back at their track record and try to work, work, parse it out that way. But this game is such a unique beast that. They could kind of do it however they want and really come up with a, a, a significant, you know, one of a kind game plan just for this and just where that old stuff wouldn't count anymore. and wouldn't make sense. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, your guess is as good as mine, though, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of energy behind Elden Ring and there's a, right. lot, a lot of anticipation. As as we all know, as you know, in particular, we'll touch on that more because it's comical at this point. But yeah, people want to see it. I don't know that they would do a, hey, on this date, we're going to do the gameplay reveal of Elden Ring. Because I feel like, right. I mean, that probably would garner some headlines, but I feel like it wouldn't have the same impact if we just got a, a gameplay trailer. And I agree. In regards to Xbox, I know they have hired or are hiring a contracted video producer to work on a series of, of events. And the contract ends right after E3. So I don't know if this is to prep everything for E3 but there is speculation right. that they are doing a series of video style events. Maybe not like a state of play, but um, from what I have heard, they are gonna be working to do more video stuff leading up to E3. Um, so there again, there's some speculation that, I don't know, they might be working on something. Again, the rumor is, you know, there's in March, we're gonna see Elden Ring, but th there's a rumor right. every single month that we're gonna see Elden Ring for some reason. So it's, it's hard to take that kind of stuff seriously. But I do know that Xbox is working to have more video of 
maybe not events, but video presentations leading up to E3. Yeah, and uh, I I think that would um that would work because I you know I think I, I I definitely heard the sometime in February or March for for Elden Ring, uh, but that was never again I've, I've said this repeatedly it was never a sure thing there was never a, a solid date uh, that stuff is definitely still fluid game development still hard um, marketing games is actually still pretty hard and they're figuring it out the best way to do it and. Um, and, and and yeah, again, no one knows for sure if this game has the Microsoft marketing exclusivity. Like, no one's exactly. been able to nail that down. Uh, uh, my, I, I definitely know that Microsoft was was trying to get it, and they probably still, if, if they don't have it, they're probably still trying to get it if it's still available. Um, so you know, we'll have to just kind of wait and see. I know that's not the answer people want, but it's, we need it yeah, now, uh, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think like Imran like was saying, that he thinks it's definitely before E three. Um, We'll see. Like, I, I would just, I would, I, the, I would hesitate. I would just tell everyone, like, let's take a deep breath and let's wait to hear what From says. And let's let From come out and tell, tell us exactly what's going on with this game. Um, because you just, you just never know. If things could get, but things could just hit a road bump and get knocked off and you, you just never know. But um, I'm still pretty excited to see it. I think we're going to see it probably pretty soon still, but I don't know for sure. So let, let's wait and see. Exactly. We, we all want to see it, but we don't know. Yeah. Um, quick shout out to the 200 people joining us live. Appreciate you guys. Again, if you're new, uh, feel free to like, subscribe. If you're enjoying the show, share it out. Um, and then we have a super chat hype from Mr. Joanna Dark. Uh, more shelf talk. Do you think the switch being on filled Phil? <laughs> do you think the switch being on Phil's shelf signals Game Pass cloud streaming coming to Nintendo? I, I think that was like you know I think that that is the one up there that is maybe, maybe the most far fetched or at least the one where it's um the conversations are the least serious mm -hmm. and if I'm sure I, my, my guess is there's conversations happening with every single thing on that shelf even Nintendo. But just because, I mean, people are talking all the time. Businesses always are talking to one another. Everyone's always thinking like, hey, could we buy this thing? And they're, and they're doing that for everything. Um, and so, yeah, I, the Switch being up there is definitely also significant, but it's on, it's a gradient, right? It's, it is like maybe the least significant thing up there. And we'll just have to like wait and see if, if anything happens with that. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, would, I would say that, the the uh, like the the things you suggested like a you know, game pass on on switch i'm sure that's stuff that phil wants i think he said as much um but but whether or not that's actually imminent probably not that's probably not imminent yeah as much as phil would love that to happen i yeah i don't think that that's if there was a tease with the switch i don't think that's what it is it could be something very silly and very minimal but i don't think the switch being on a shelf indicates that xbox game pass for sure is coming to switch Yep. at all but <laughs> yep, it's fun to speculate not. again like i talked yeah. about already I, I like going down the rabbit holes but uh, again you you can get lost you can get yourself in a situation where you're lo you're looking way too deep into things that have no relevance at all mm -hmm. um paris says it's konami they are acquiring konami which uh there was a <laughs> A leak recently from Windows Central, apparently, that said uh, Xbox is buying Konami. I don't know if you saw that <laughs> making the rounds, but I was like... I didn't. I missed that one. Ah, we had to go on Twitter and be like, no, stop, please. No one from Windows Central said this. Stop. <laughs> Again, and then that got me going down the rabbit hole. I'm like, okay, so if Xbox is acquiring Konami, Konami doesn't have a huge pool of developers. So that means they could have ninja theory make the god of war-esque castlevania reboot let's go <laughs> let's go um sounds, sounds awesome sounds perfect yeah sounds way too good to be true uh, yeah <laughs> super chat hype from georgie jeff you think xbox will buy a japanese studio uh i i don't know uh, that one i'm i it, it's always like why wouldn't they but there's a lot of reasons why they wouldn't and buying a japanese studio if you're an american company is a, is a, is a challenging legal undertaking and you know if there's a company in the world that could figure that out it's one of one of them is microsoft for sure but um uh would it be worth the effort is there another way to get that juice from from a different kind of squeeze other than buying a company probably there's probably some partnerships they could work out that would probably that wouldn't give them necessarily the same sort of control but um 
I don't know, like Sony clearly receding from Japan in a way, uh, clearly saying, hey, uh, we, we want to make global hits. And so and but we also know there's a lot of weebs out there. So if you want to like if there's people that are going to want Japanese ass Japanese games. Right. Um, and there's going to be studios. that want to keep making those games. So if Microsoft can come in and say, hey, we will we'll give you some money to make sure that you could continue making the kind of games you want, uh, especially as these new studios start to pop up after uh, Sony Japan, you know, close. There's uh, or, yeah, PlayStation Studios Japan, Japan. I think that's how you say it. Um, I, as though as that studio closes and there's, there's other developers spinning out from there making their own thing uh, they're going to be looking for a home for a home and the obvious one for them is, is nintendo switch that's very popular in japan um but then when those companies look for places to spread their game out worldwide uh you know game pass could be right there waiting for them and i think that that those kinds of deals maybe make more sense or at least easier for microsoft to pull off and so I wouldn't be surprised if they go down that path. And that one's a little bit less exciting because, you know, there's not they don't have quite as big, big a budgets. And uh, those partnerships could always dissolve. We've seen that happen before with, with Platinum and Microsoft. Um, but I, I still think that buying a studio is such a challenge that Microsoft may not be able to pull that off. Yeah, it's really complicated uh, when you start getting in other countries, uh, especially Japan. Uh the, yeah. the, the culture there is, is, is very interesting. And as you pointed out, yeah, so we've seen Sony, which has historically been a, a Japanese company, PlayStation being a Japanese brand, they are starting to lose market share in Japan. They're getting completely dominated by the Switch, which that makes sense. That is a very, ja mm -hmm. Nintendo is a very Japanese company, but they're sh transitioning to obviously cater to a more Western audience with all of their big releases. Um, and I, I wonder kind of what the logistics are there. I mean, obviously Western, the Western audience is bigger, so that's probably a big factor of it is yeah. there's more potential people to buy these games. Whereas Japan as, you know, big as it is in the, the video game ethos in terms of just sheer population and numbers, it's, it's not that big in the grand scheme. Yeah, of PlayStation the world. 4 just didn't sell very well there. It sold pretty poorly. So the people just aren't interested in home console gaming in Japan anymore. And that's what Sony does. So that's probably, they're not going to focus on it. And I, and, and to me, I, I think it's a little bit of a mistake. I think that um, part of Sony's appeal to a lot of people is that it's from Japan. And I think a lot of, a lot of PlayStation fans are, bit, they are weebs. I think a lot of them are, and you know, they, they, they want that stuff and that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, and, but I think if Sony's going to be like, um, the answer to this, the answer to this problem is make games feel more worldwide and more global. Um, yeah, the, the, maybe maybe they know better. Maybe that'll work out. But I think that may, they might lose some of their mystique, and that could hurt them. Uh, I, I, but but yeah, I, I mean, with, with Nintendo Switch right there, I think a lot of developers are also going to just be looking. Hey, we can. W there is a home for us. Switch is doing fine in Japan, so yeah, but they might go there instead. And Sony might not want to just compete with that and say, hey, this is. We will, we will, we'll figure out our own way. And I think like we, we seen what they did with, with uh, Kojima, with Kojima studios, um, Death Stranding came out and it wasn't a mega hit and it wasn't profitable enough. And I think that's what we saw with, with them say about PlayStation Japan studios. Um, and so, you know, Death Stranding, not profitable enough. We're not going to probably work with you on your next game, Kojima. Sorry. Um, and that's going to leave it up open to like Microsoft to swoop in or, or Stadia at one point. Um, and and I think that those are the kinds of deals that we'll see is is Microsoft starting to fund games in the way that Sony funded Death Stranding in, in Japan, at least for sure. Yeah, that would be really interesting to see, because I know historically Xbox has been a little bit burned by their second party kind of partnerships and relationships. We've had a lot of non in-house studios sign on to do projects that didn't see the light of day. And so I wonder mm -hmm with their new approach because of the vessel of game pass, if they're a little more open to that possibility, because it takes a little bit of the pressure off. Um, but I would be interested to see what that kind of looks like because they have their, their publishing partner, the, what is it? Uh, is it just called Xbox publishing Xbox blanking? I think that's right. Yeah. It might just yeah. be called Xbox, Xbox publishing, but Xbox game studios publishing, something like some, that, something you know? like that, but they have that as a yeah. vessel now to get these games out there. So I would love to see if they aren't buying, Japanese studios, I would love to see them at least collaborate and partner with them more because again, and that's just more for the people really invest in the industry. Cause that is, those are the people who are going to be really excited to see those kinds of, those kinds of headlines, because I agree. like we talked about J Japan is, 
important to gaming, but niche when it comes to overall sales. Um, yeah, and really what's important now in Japan are, are, the, are the studios, are the developers. And uh, uh, if they don't have necessarily an audience on PlayStation to sell to, they're going to, you know, we don't want them to all go to mobile, right? I mean, mobile, there's money in mobile, uh, but a lot of those studios want to keep making games for consoles and PC. And hopefully we, we find a way for them to, to find an outlet and keep continuing to make products so that they don't disappear and we don't lose that sort of that tradition of of console gaming out of japan um that's that is what's crucial now and I, you know phil clearly i think understands this and, and sees an opportunity um and then you know the switch being popular is going to create a certain market for, for japanese studio studios and their games for some time but it might not be exactly the same as what they were doing when they were making games for playstation so uh you know and microsoft would offer that opportunity because it's a similar console so I, I I think that those those studios will figure something out. It's, it's just going to be another sort of growing pain moment for for Japanese game development, which you know they've seen a lot of, and they always come out the other side, and usually making better games than ever. So I'm looking forward to that part of it, where they get on the other side of this and say, "Hey, we, you know, we'll, we'll we'll continue making our, our our new kind of global hits, uh, but still with that Japanese flavor." And I'm you know I'm I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's it's really important, especially as you know someone who's grew up playing Japanese games. Like A Link to the Past was the very first game that I ever played. And that was the game right. that made me realize like how important and impactful a game can be. And that, that formula inspired just generations and generations of games. So there yep. is something very important about Japanese development. And that's not something that I would ever want to see go away at all. I just want to, yes. I, I would love to see it. I would love to see those teams get bigger budgets to make massive scale games. Um, let me get to a couple super chats real quick here. Fletch, drop your question again. It seems like your super chat got messed up, but there is a super chat from Fletch. Drop it in, I'll get back to it. Um, and we got another one from Raw89. Jeff, when do you see the Bethesda deal closing? Uh, Mid-March. Uh, I know there's that lawsuit that might mess things up a little bit, might just delay things a little bit, but I, I doubt it. Uh, Mid-March mid is when I see that closing. Um, uh, so we'll hear about it soon. And if there's any issues, I don't think it'll, it'll get pushed too much pa past that. Uh, really, it's just down to regulate regulators coming, coming, uh, coming across with your answer about whether or not this is legal. And once they do that, Microsoft and Bethesda won't wait very long to just say, Hey, all right, let's talk about what this means now. So mm -hmm. yeah, a Co yeah. couple more weeks and then we'll hear coming soon. And then, yep. um, it's, you know, you were the one that apparently leaked the uh, the Bethesda event according to the internet but in a in a podcast you were talking about a Bethesda event do you want to touch on that at all or yeah i i would say that if the if if you are looking at microsoft's roadmap and it, for for events um that there wouldn't be much on there except for uh when the Bethesda deal closes they're going to talk about that in some way and whether or not that that feels like a like a direct style thing i i doubt it i bet it's more, it's a little bit more informational than that but they'll they'll talk about what the, the future of the games and what it means and, and stuff but a lot of it's probably going to be like and now check in with us at e3 which is probably the next major thing on on the uh, on the roadmap um you know they'll have they'll, they'll sprinkle in one sort of like pc game announcement in there um but in between that time between the march and the and june e3 stuff um but but this is yeah this is like their one sort of moment where they're going to talk about the stuff before e3 is kind of how i would put it and whether or not that yeah that feels like a, a full-fledged event i couldn't say for sure it, there is a lot of speculation regarding E3 this year because of the cost and it being digital only and a lot of companies kind of understanding that they can get headlines and they can get attention by just doing their own events. A lot of people are wondering if Xbox will be at E3. I personally think they're, it's kind of old fashioned, but I do think that they will have a big E3 presence, whereas some of the other companies won't. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on if you think Xbox will officially be at E3 this year? Uh, my, my understanding was it was leaning towards no. It was leaning towards going rogue in, in terms of E3. Um, it, and I, I think if Microsoft does that, no one else is going to go with E3. So it's it's a big, like, you know... Um, uh, uh, it's it's a it's a big forecast for the future of E3. Like, where does what's Microsoft going to do? But um, 
I just don't, Microsoft just doesn't see, like no one does, but also Microsoft doesn't see the benefit of, of paying the big bills to get into the E3 thing when they could just do their own thing and do it on their own schedule and not have to worry about this other entity saying, hey, we have our needs too. And Microsoft said, well, I, okay, what does that mean to us? Why do we care about that? We paid you. Um, so uh, yes, my, my understanding was the last I heard, and this was a few weeks ago, that they were, they were leaning towards going rogue. And so I, I would expect it to probably still go that way. The, all, all of the indicators suggest that it's just not worth it to go with E3 in the, in the ESA. Yeah, I, I hope they go rogue. That's what I want to see. And then I, once Xbox leaves, because they were the last kind of major element of E3, like keeping E3 relevant. Um, so if, if Xbox pulls out and they do just go completely rogue and do their own set of video conferences, that really kind of destroys the, the mainstream appeal of E3. If all of the biggest companies are not involved with E3, what is the, the relevance? Why would anyone pay six figures to be at E3? Yep. It just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. There's no upside really to it. Uh, all these companies know how to do their own events. All of them have staff on hand now, especially after last year, to specifically figure out how to do stuff digitally. Um, and there's a lot of freedom there inherent to doing your own thing digitally and working within the ESA's confines takes away that, a lot of that freedom. And the benefit is what you're on e3.com, maybe, I guess, uh, e3news.com, whatever the website is. And I, I, I don't know, like, you know, Nintendo also is tr pretty traditional, pretty usually goes with E3, but you know, we know they don't need E3. We saw the direct had 1.5 million people or whatever watching live. They don't need any help from the ESA. So, and, and the truth is that all these companies are in similar situations where they can draw their own audiences. Um, so the, is the ESA really going to come to them and say, Hey, come to us. We'll help you build an audience that, that might work with some of these smaller companies. They can't afford to actually pay the ESA like their, their blood money or whatever. Um, so it's just it's just in a weird position, and I, I I think if I'm Microsoft, I'm not I am not going to try to deal with these with with this company or with this organization. We'll figure it out on our on our own. Thank you very much, and good luck is what they're going to say. And go do their own thing. So it'll be around the same time though. It'll be that that E three week, um, but it'll be like like EA has done in the past few years and stuff like that, where it'll just kind of happen on its own, and there will be no E three branding, but everyone will still call it E three. It'll be in that window where everyone's expecting yeah. th this news, but yeah, it's not, I don't, I don't see it being tied. I would, I, I would be very shocked if Xbox, a company all about logistics says, yeah, six figures is worth it to have a digital only event, which we could easily produce ourselves. In fact, we'd have to produce the event anyway to submit to E3 since it's digital. Um, but we'll just pay mm -hmm. six figures to have them put it on their Twitch channel. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Doesn't make a lot of sense. No. no. A uh, couple super chats, uh, Faisal007, uh, Jeff, how much of Xbox Series X is future proof compared to, to P? Okay, how, how future proofed is the Xbox Series X compared to the PlayStation? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're, they're pretty equivalent. Um, I, I don't know, I, these systems are gonna be around for the, 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 what is now pretty standard seven to eight year cycle uh and i think the, the question is just how do they do uh mid generation updates how do they how do they refresh this hardware um it almost it might not even matter that much how future proof is because if you are a hardcore fan and in four years there's uh new hardware you're probably going to buy that too aren't you like what's admitted to ourselves so we're probably going to buy the upgrades mm -hmm. if they're available um and so if, if, if that comes across, it, the future proofness might not matter so much, but just like looking at the hardware, uh, both these systems have enough power to, yeah, to run for quite some time. And especially because, yeah, uh, PC hardware is, is getting pretty, pretty awesome, but uh, most people are still just gonna be running at 1080p 60 and looking for hardware to do that. Like the 3060 that came out, you know, the box right here, uh, the 3060 is going to just kind of be probably the most popular uh, graphics card for, for the next year or so um and and it's going to be a 1080p 60 card uh and i think the idea is we are at a baseline for graphics and visuals where you know you you don't need much more than that and um the, the like the amd rx 580 from 2016 could probably still run most of the games they're going to run a 1080 1080 60 on here at around 1080 60 with, with some a few sacrifices and developers are going to continue developing games for cards like that and it's going to make it so that 
yeah, we're, we're, the the other the 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 advantages will come from stuff like the CPU and stuff that you could sort of fudge on on less powerful hardware, and so it's not going to really push these systems too hard too soon. Um, and I, I so I expect that the PlayStation Five, Xbox Series X to be just fine for a very long time. I I would not be surprised if. Uh, you know, regardless of how the inner generation updates happen, if this is the longest generation ever, these systems are very powerful out of the gate, very fresh, very new, uh, using some top end AMD stuff. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's, they are in a better situation hardware wise, definitely than the PS4 and Xbox One. Definitely those systems were but right out of the gate. And then uh, the, even the PlayStation 3 and, and Xbox 360, which did have like an eight year cycle. Um, I think these are better positioned than even those were at that time. So yeah, it's exciting. It's yeah, it's really exciting because yeah, especially when we're comparing it to PS4, Xbox One, I was doing some research for a piece about FPS boost and like looking at some of the launch titles for the Xbox One, we had we had 720p, thir- like not even 30 FPS, like exclusives launching when these consoles dropped yep. which is like that's not even better than what the 360 was pumping out when that when that was around we were used to 1080 games uh, getting yep. transitioning into xbox one and then this new hardware drops and the resolution is dropped so it's exciting that these uh, these consoles are launching with brand new pieces of hardware and brand new software yes. as well um, that kind of opens up some possibilities to a an extended tail because realistically, a lot of developers aren't even fully like they don't fully understand these kits yet. Uh, DirectX 12, right. the RDNA 2.0, like a lot of those features, uh, we won't even see those fully utilized for like a year. Like so, we have it'll be a year before we even see these kits like get to what they can potentially be. So I think we'll have you know a good a really good tail on the system. I am curious, especially with Xbox's series branding whether or not we see uh refreshes sooner than we have in the past yeah but but i think even um like what what is the motivation there i think they want to keep i think the real motivation is let's keep uh the the hardcore interested in new hardware so that they are the ones sort of subsidizing the the uh expansion of the hardware base and what i mean by that is if you look to uh, the way nintendo nintendo handles handhelds um the hardcore go out and buy the like I bought I don't know five six 3ds's or whatever. And what I do with the other 3ds's, most of them I sold secondhand, and so I am I am creating new users by paying for the new system. I get the new system, and now I, I'm selling one cheaper. And now someone else that wouldn't want to buy a system full price is out there. And now they're buying software, and I think Microsoft sees that the, a similar opportunity with with the, with home console hardware, and. The idea is like let's keep the 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 most hardcore interested. Give them the stuff they want. We want more new shiny stuff. But what are they going to do with their old hardware? We want to make sure they could sell that to someone else, and then someone else could keep playing game on games on that hardware. So in order for that to work, that old hardware needs to keep being supported. And I think this is the this is the same motivation for developers, right? And developers don't want to just develop games for the most powerful hardware they want to make service games that run on everything that run on phones and can be supported for a long time I and mean, we're, we're at a point where phones are going to be a real consideration people are going to want games to run natively on phones not just over the cloud and so if, if that's your motivation i think that uh, and it, to get to the widest audience possible it's just we're not going to end up in a, a circumstance where most games like even close to like the majority of games are uh, pushing these systems to a point where they can't handle it anymore. Even as we get new and more powerful upgraded hardware down the line, um, I think that the PlayStation 5 right now and the Xbox Series X and even the Series S are going to be just fine for what they are for years and years and years uh, to the point where don't worry about future proof. You're going to be just fine. If you're someone who doesn't want to upgrade, you're going to get just as much support as everyone else. And that's really cool. That's that's not going to separate the audience as much. And that's going to, especially yeah. with a lot of companies wanting the broad appeal because we look at the gaming industry and how it continues to grow. And at this point in the United States, it's bigger than pretty much any other form of media, bigger than most of them combined even. So they, they understand that. And steam even has data to suggest that even on the PC side of things, as much as we hear the conversations about, you know, elite hardware and PC offers the best experience. There's a lot of data to suggest that the average person playing PC games does not have a top of the line graphics card. No, 1060. They have a 1060. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So 
as much as we want to see games fully take advantage of this hardware and fully push this hardware to the limit, as a developer and as a publisher especially, it doesn't make sense to do that because you are just going to really hinder the audience of that game. If you yep. say you need a $3,000 rig to run this game, like you are not going to you're not going to make your money back. Right. I mean, it, you just look to Fortnite. You look to Fortnite. It runs on everything. It looks good on everything. It, even on the best looking hardware, it still looks pretty close to what it looks like on a Switch. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll get more frames per second, but like, yeah, okay, you'll get more frames per second. And that's awesome. And that's, that's what you're going to get with your, with your awesome hardware. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be all necessarily all new experiences that couldn't happen any other way. And, and when those, when those things do happen, Again, it's going to be because because of the CPUs enabling better simulation, uh, better uh, AI, better interactions with the world, um, and and that that is stuff that if if it becomes popular, they actually could unload some of that stuff onto the cloud on other systems on, on older hardware if they needed to. Um, so right now, it's great that it's in all these systems. Both the PlayStation Five and, and and Xbox Series consoles have really great CPUs. Developers could take advantage of that, see if that stuff is going to be appealing, if there's an audience for really com complicated simulated worlds. Um, and if there is, uh, they'll figure out the other side of it if they need to get that stuff running on phones or whatever. So, yeah. Have you tried a uh, control on the Switch? I did. I, I, I started it. I did the, the free trial of it, and it was the best cloud, actually, the best cloud play I had on, on anything. Uh, I was so shocked far. by how did good that looked and how yeah. well it ran. I, it was it was surprising and like i i don't know much about like the cloud infrastructure that they're using but it was yeah it was you know i've never had super awful experiences with stadia or whatever stadia worked pretty well and um uh, stuff like nvidia's uh, nvidia's similar service they, they work uh but that control just was like flawless almost it was really surprising i almost want to get hitman i play, I play hitman on everything and i'm like oh, i should just get hitman 3 on the switch and do that there and see if it runs as well so i might, might check that out but yeah it was really impressive it's cool to see nintendo coming up with these creative solutions to get the third party games on their platform because that is going to be a, an ongoing issue for them because the hardware limitations of the switch in particular, um, we're going to, especially starting now, we're not going to see a lot of third party games right. coming to switch at this point, unless the, the, the fabled switch pro becomes a reality. Um, it's, it's going to be really hard for the average developer to port their game to switch. I mean, have you booted up arc? On, on switch have you seen that i that i have no interest in even seeing <laughs> i did uh the outer outer wild outer worlds um and that was rough that was real rough so yeah i can only imagine arc is a qu quite a mess on the it switch. is one of the ugliest things i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and i don't know why they even signed off on it but yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a problem um super chat hype from mr joanna dark um with rumors of a castlevania reboot I hope you're not just um, looking at my random tweets, but would you like to see a Bloodborne style approach to the game or a Dead Cells slash Hollow Knight style game? Are you a big Metroidvania guy? Yeah, man. Uh, so when those Castlevania Metroidvania games were coming once a year, it was just the best. I was working at Subway and I would bring my Game Boy Advance or whatever into work and would just pray that it would get slow so i could just go sit in the back and play some some awesome you know castlevania metroidvania games uh they yeah they were like the big they were the thing i was looking forward to the most each year when they were coming out and i um i really do miss them and i i liked uh uh bloodstained yeah i like bloodstained quite a bit that was a, a good one and I, i'm glad that there's so many indie developers have tried to fill that space but i would like to see castlevania come back but the problem is i really do think igarashi was crucial to those games kind of becoming what they were um but it's, I guess at the same point, if the Konami's in a situation where they are outsourcing these sort of things, um, why wouldn't they just work with this with an indie studio that's proven they could do uh, uh, Castlevania or Metroidvania style games? Because there's a lot of them now. A lot of studios could do that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, 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 that's what I would want. I would want just another one of those. But that's just me. Absolutely. That's what I would love to see. I, I loved Bloodstained. I, I beat that like three or four times. But I was mm -hmm. also very desperate for that formula, that style. As much as I loved Hollow Knight, like that was a, a really great Metroidvania. And as much as I loved Ori, it for me personally, it's just hard to fill the Castlevania void. They are similar in a lot of ways, but they're not Castlevania. And I yeah. would love to see Konami figure out someone to make a great Castlevania Metroidvania. And I'm sure there is a line of indie developers out the door who would do it. Um, 
So I really hope with with the talks of them kind of reevaluating Silent Hill and re and kind of reevaluating releases like Contra Rogue Core, um, which was just shockingly yeah. bad. I I don't yeah. understand how fake. they expected to make money off Metal Gear Survive yeah. or Contra Rogue Core. So I'm glad they at least have publicly acknowledged that those games did not do well and they will not be doing games like that. And they're trying to identify ways that they can take their IP and probably realistically make a game for as cheap as possible. That isn't garbage. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Realistically, yes, that's exactly what they'll do. Like they want to, um, they're going to partner with probably middle tier developers to indie developers to put out these titles to kind of, you know, at least gauge interest again. I don't see Konami. Yeah, invest- the low, the low, right? yeah they'll go to the lowest bidder mm-hmm. and that's how they'll do it. And, and yeah, I think the dream would be like the, all these franchises come back and then we see new ways to, to express, you know, Castlevania, new ways to express Metal Gear. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of like a Bloodborne style Castlevania absolutely could work. That would be, that would be really cool to try to see them do that. Uh, but that is such a pie in the sky thing right now, right? Because we can't even, it's hard to even imagine them pulling off a 2D indie style Castlevania Metroidvania, right? So um, the idea that they would then find a way to, to you know, satisfactorily clone from software seems like just an absurd notion. So uh, I I try not to get my hopes up too much for anything Konami related basically is where I'm at in life. And it's worked out fine the last couple of years. (laughs) (laughs) It it hurts. It really hurts. Um, Just being someone of that era. I love Konami games and I love, they had a good, really good streak for a really long time, but that that died like mid mid to late 2000s we had, we haven't had a uh, what i would consider a great konami game and it's it's been sad mm-hmm. because they're sitting on so many great ip um so i would love to see to your point a a bloodborne style castlevania and that idea to me is especially interesting because to me from software's formula has always been if you made Castlevania a 3D game, if you made a Metroidvania a 3D yes. action RPG, that is what Dark Souls is. So that idea of Castlevania coming back in the space in that style, to me, would be like the best case scenario. Do I think it's going to happen? No. Uh, no. God, no. At least no. unless <laughs> unless they put out a really cheap game that just crushes and does super well, I don't think that will probably ever happen. But I'm at least excited about the possibility of some sort of castlevania game and some sort of silent hill game um that isn't contra rogue core and that isn't metal gear survive and isn't silent Same. hill downpour um their <laughs> track record of late has been bad it's it's probably for the best that a silent hill game didn't come out in the last 10 years because right Yes. Yeah. It would have just been, I mean, it would have been disappointing, I'm sure. Um, and I guess, you know, there's a chance that, that, you know, whatever's happening with Silent Hill uh, will be fine. will be fun. Uh, but it's probably, you know, there's a, a huge risk still that it's, co- if it's involved with Konami it could still be pretty disappointing. So uh, I hope those fans are served well uh, when, it, whenever we do get whatever we get. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> uh, super chat from Faisal 007. Jeff, where do you see the future of Kojima? Uh, I, I think broadly, I, I see him continuing to work with Kojima, with his productions, Kojima Productions. Is that, is that the name of the studio? Uh, I think um, I, he's going to maintain the studio. He'll continue to find work. Um, I, I think he's probably going to spend the next couple of years here uh, seeing if he can find like a permanent partner like uh, sony doesn't seem like it's going to work out sony is not necessarily interested in the kinds of games that kojima was going to make and um at, at least right now and maybe kojima gets over that and starts making broad you know broad western style games with a lot of global appeal and then maybe they, he gets to go back to sony but um there, there are going to be people getting in line to still want to work with him and uh and i think that microsoft is probably trying to make a deal happen i i, I think that um whether or not they're going to be able to pull that off and what that even looks like is going to, because like if you're Microsoft, you know, what, what do you want them to do? You just want them to kind of come in and do whatever, but that, that has some appeal, but we've already sort of seen that with Death Stranding and Death Stranding has a lot of fans, but it was not a Metal Gear style moment. It, or it, but yeah, it wasn't like, uh, the, the, it wasn't like to the point where if Death Stranding 2 got announced that people would be losing their minds in the same way. Um, it, 
And I, so do you want him to come in and like, see if you can nail down one of his old franchises for him to work on? Well, there's a lot of baggage involved with that. First, you do ha have to work with Konami. That's no one wants to do that. And then second, you have to deal with like the, the expectations inherent to that stuff. So um, I, I don't know. It's like, I, like, what's the best way to even use Kojima? Um, it, it, it's difficult. So, uh, but still, there is a lot of value in getting Kojima's name on a game. Uh, and, and really, it just comes down to managing that budget, managing the direction, uh, seeing if you can get, get a game out. And at least he's proven that with Death Stranding, he can get a game out way faster than anyone thought he could. And it's a, a, a pretty solid game. Um, and so I think everyone kind of assumed we would never, ever see that game, uh, at least not for like a t 10 years or something like that. And when he delivered it in a matter of a couple of years, it's like, okay, he's proven himself to be able to pull this stuff off and ship a game um, that was generally well-liked. And then, uh, so, so his value hasn't like gone down. It, it's it's going to kind of be the same. And now just bring him and see if you could figure out a good way to use him. And if you're Microsoft, you, get, you maybe you see like, yeah, there's potential there. And I, I think Google was clearly one of the other companies trying to get him down uh, under their books. Um, and they, 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 those won't be the only two. Though I'm sure like big companies are like Activision and stuff like that are probably sniffing around, uh, but they're not going to be able to compete with Microsoft just in terms of, oh, if we work with Microsoft, that's Kojima Productions. Um, we know that they want a lot of games right now. We know that they have a lot of money um, and we know that they have like a, you know, a console exclusive sort of fan base that would be really excited that Kojima has come to Microsoft or something like that. So uh, I guess on the micro scale, I do kind of, I, my guess is the next one probably does end up with Microsoft. Uh, if, 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 if I had to put my money down, but no guarantees there and no news to necessarily <laughs> to break there. Just kind of just that, that would be my guess, my hunch. I, I am. Yeah. I'm very, I guess not confident, but I think it would be very likely that Phil is approaching Kojima about the, about his next project. Uh, what that looks like, who knows? I imagine it would right. probably be another new IP because it seems like that yeah. is Kojima's interest. I don't really see Kojima wanting to go back to like a, a Metal Gear at this point, especially like you said, if Konami's involved. There's, I don't right. see that bridge ever being repaired. Like there is on both sides. I don't think Konami would even want to work with Kojima. Like, um, so I don't see them going back to Metal Gear. But I do see the value of Kojima as a creator in the video game industry. Um, and with Death Stranding, yeah, it didn't take him 10 years to make, and it wasn't a big flop, which is that, that right. was some of the speculation is that this game would take forever, it would cost unlimited amounts of money, and it would just be received very middling. But positive reviews, um, you know, some people thought it was a little boring, but if you look at what, what the presentation was and what he was trying to do, it was a really cool, unique game, and it offered something... Yes fully unique in the space. And it was a very, a very much a Kojima production. Um, yes. And the video game industry needs big figures like that. We look at all the, you know, Kojima is obviously obsessed with Hollywood and he, he loves big film. And there's a lot of characters in, in Hollywood and film. And it's, it's fun to have figures like that in the gaming industry that have this reputation everyone regardless of whether you like like it or not you're going to pay attention to what the next kojima production pro project is so i would love to he's see he's just really good at marketing too right like he's just good at marketing he's good at like building up hype for his games uh the trailers are always so strange and it's lots of speculation and he's good at that set of stuff and it turns out gamers love that stuff we love to get hype about commercials for video games and he plays into that better than anyone alive and mm -hmm. um it would be sad uh, to lose that and I don't think we're I don't think we're at risk of like losing that I think he's he's gonna stick to making games for quite some time um and and so yeah and and, just, and but I just don't the, the thought of him not having a, a vast outlet with like a pretty decent budget to pull that stuff off uh, would be pretty sad and I also think we're not at risk of losing that either I think he's gonna he's gonna continue to find work he's gonna continue to sign deals there will be people that want to work with him if no one else 10 cents eventually will just come in and give him <laughs> some money so yeah yeah, yeah. And it, I think it makes total sense that Xbox would be involved because we know that Death Stranding did not hit the financial goals that Sony set for it. It was an expensive game to make. The budget was pretty big and yep. it sold well, like it didn't sell bad by any means, but it did not recoup Just enough. It's not profitable enough. Yep. Exactly. And that's, again, that's what these companies are about. Um, and Xbox right now, their profit profitability is based more on getting people into Game Pass um, so mm -hmm. I think for them, that opens up a little more flexibility if they can just use the hype and energy of 
the next Kojima production launching into Game Pass as like a metric for getting new users. Because for them, that is their biggest goal. Xbox's right. biggest goal right now is getting as many people as possible into Game Pass. And so they're going to do kind of whatever that takes. And they're going to spend whatever they need to spend, as we saw with the Bethesda deal. It dropped $7.5 billion. And the primary goal of that was getting people to subscribe to Game Pass. So Yep. Yeah, but I think Kojima could make, you know, if this training is any indi indicator, make some games that would do pretty well in Game Pass. Games that like, oh, now that I have Game Pass, I'm finally going to try this. And I think uh, that that's the kind of that's the kind of game Death Stranding is. I wouldn't be surprised if Death Stranding eventually does find its way onto Game Pass in some way. Um, that would be nice. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think if that's kind of where his head is at and making those these kinds of weird but still really cool games, um, you can't you can't find a much better audience for that than game pass i think because that's an audience now that is willing to try stuff um and that's kind of i think what kojima wants yeah i don't want to drink the the xbox kool-aid too much but there's a lot of developers who've come out and basically talked about the the freedoms that they have with game pass and the freedoms that they have under xbox game studios and you know i'm sure some of that's just marketing bs to some degree, but I want to believe, degree, sure. I believe, I want to believe it's at some level that that is fundamentally true and that the, the system of game pass allows these talented people to take risks because that is something that's been lost in the gaming industry. When you compare like the OG Xbox and PS one lineup of games, it was all over the place that nothing was right. off the table. Nothing was off limits. So we got some incredible innovative ideas. And then towards the tail end of the Xbox 360 into Xbox One and PS4, things have become very formulaic in terms of like, is this going to make money? We're only going to publish this big game if there is a 80% chance we're going to make money on this. Um, yep. And it's become a numbers game to the point where we're not getting a lot of varying styles of games that are big budget. We're getting shooters, we're getting sports games, and we're getting when it comes to PlayStation, like single player narrative experiences, because that is right. a formula that sells well, does well. And because of that, we're not getting anybody with a big budget taking any risks. Yep. I mean, and, and yeah, and you kind of look, I think Sony is the best indication there. And it's, it, people want those kinds of games and Sony's making them and they got very good at making them. And, but it is one style of game, right? Um, it is mostly one style of game. And so, um, I mean, what what is the antidote there? Yeah, Microsoft could try to match them one for one. And I think they will try to make Sony style games to a certain extent, but they're gonna. I think the real antidote here is let us create a, a, an ecosystem where a, a wider variety of games can succeed. And I think it's going to be appealing to a lot of um, a lot of creators. And I think I, I think we've seen that. I think that like, those developers they don't just come out and say, oh, um, oh, we have um, we've seen that people try our games more. They also say, okay, and now for my next game, I'm going to go back to Game Pass again. We're going to sign mm -hmm. a new deal and go mm -hmm. back there. So, uh, you know, to me that, you know, without having hard numbers, without being able to see the data ourselves, what's the best indicator that that it's working for developers? And it's that. If you're going back there and signing your next game to be on Game Pass as well, there's something there. Um, and, I, and, and yeah, and so I, I'm, the, the hope, I think, for Microsoft and, and for, you know, for the people making games there is that this, is this, this way of doing things is going to enable them to make such a wide variety of games that they can appeal to different people who aren't necessarily just there for Sony first-party style games. Sorry, my kids are fighting. I don't know if you can hear them or not. I got, I got NVIDIA broadcast on, but if you can hear them, they have such beautiful voices. They do, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want... People like Tim Schafer to have a big pile of money to make whatever nonsense they want. Um, I want people like Bloober. I'm a big horror fan, and people kind of you know, critique Bloober for the, the quality of their games. But at the end of the day, they right. are an independent studio, and they have proven that they have raw talent and they have great ideas. And if you can give people with great ideas the means to make great games, they will. And that's why I think a vessel like Game Pass will open up a, a broader kind of scope of great games. Um, at least that's what I that's what I want to believe, and that's what I hope we start seeing here Same. in the next few years. Yeah, um, yeah, and it really just comes down to like you make the games better. Just if you're gonna you like it, Sony's, yeah, Sony makes a certain style game and they do it very well. The more important part of that is they do it very well. Mm -hmm. Like yes. if you were making a, a different style game but also doing it better than anyone else, 
those games would also have similar kinds of success. So just really focus, move beyond a lot of different mediocre games. See if you could get a few that are feel really super polished, because that seems to be what makes the difference for you know a game that is um, well regarded and has a lot of fans. To oh, this is the game that everyone assumes is going to be game of the year or whatever. Uh, and, and I you know I think if you're Microsoft, you're, you want all of it. You want you want the wide variety. You want the weird stuff. You want stuff that is fun and, and you know maybe overall mediocre but it has its fans like that's important like it works for netflix uh but you also still want those temples that hold the whole thing up that people can't stop talking about and um the, the indication from microsoft is they, they fully understand that yeah absolutely you want those marvel level games where no matter right, who yes. you are what you're into you know about it you're talking about it and you've probably played it those are the games mm -hmm. that so sony has done well a lot of people understand the value of a sony first party game sony understands the value of a first sony first party game and so does xbox there's there's no yeah. way that xbox is looking at what sony is doing and completely ignoring it they understand how successful those games are and they understand the desire of their community to have games on that level um so again yeah i want xbox to successfully deliver games on that scale i hope halo i really really hope halo infinite is their first kind of big Xbox Game Studio release that says, yeah. this is the future of Xbox Game Studios. This is the quality of the games we're making. This is a game that you cannot ignore. I really hope Halo comes out of the gate and delivers that. Um, yeah, and, and I, 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 my hope for this, I hope they're, they show us they're trying new things and that they work and that they fully understand the game they're trying to make. And if, if it feels um, fresh and new, but still distinctly Halo, uh, that would be a really important indicator that, that Microsoft has a handle on what they're doing. Absolutely. If Halo comes out and is a Halo 5 again, like after all the hype, after all the energy that's into yeah. it, they're, right. they're going to have a lot of damage control to do. They're going to have to kind of rebuild this, or kind of, yeah. I guess, defend they're the gonna, narrative. They're going to run out of chances eventually. Yeah, they're going to run out of chances. Yeah. Like, yeah. Halo Infinite, unfortunately for Xbox and unfortunately for 343 Industries, it has to be amazing. It can't be a good game. Yep. It has to be an amazing game. Unfortunately, yep. again, though, it seems like they understand that, right? It yeah. does seem like they get it. And they've been doing the updates. The recent screenshots look phenomenal. Like they did the side by sides really with what they first showed off to now. And it is day and night that I was really genuinely blown away by what that game looks like, at least from these Agreed. Sk still screenshots. Yeah. <laughs> and really, it wasn't it what Dig Digital Foundry kind of always said, but it came down to the lighting, right? <laughs> Once they kind of got the lighting right, everything is falling into place. Uh, it looks really good now. So, yeah. That, that's an interesting point. I don't think people realize. Mm how complicated and how much as players will we will have to get used to dynamic lighting and what that means mm -hmm. we're used to seeing um kind of baked in lighting and textures on on character models so no matter what the lighting is in the situation your gun your character is well lit you look you look good but people are transitioning to a world where lighting is real so if you are in shadow you're gonna be it's gonna be dark it's gonna be flat and so yeah. it's gonna be hard for developers to kind of overcome that hurdle and kind of deliver the the because people still pull up uh, like screenshots of uncharted or mm -hmm. as like the the benchmark of like what a video game can look like um but there's no dynamic lighting those are all people went in and, and sculpted all those textures and all the lighting on the character for every single scene which is impressive looks incredible um but dynamic lighting is going to be kind of the the future right. of next gen if you will just like strictly baked lightings days are numbered like that is uh, that you know it's going to take years but eventually that's just not how people are going to make games anymore um so yeah uh, it'll you know they'll find ways to be art, art, like there will still be artistry in in real time global illumination absolutely mm -hmm. um but it'll be more it'll just be more like lighting a movie scene and uh, a lot of those talents will will transfer to that um, and I'm sure Naughty Dog, uh, just like they always have, will figure out make their make their mm -hmm. games look astounding through it. But um, I think you know we'll just have, it's going to be a, a shift for gamers, and when we're and it's going to be a shift for developers. Like they uh, they shouldn't have shown uh, Halo Infinite with lighting that looked flat. They should yeah. have just made the, they should have really focused on that. And I just think they were too close and weren't thinking about it that way, and they thought everyone else would fully understand what was happening here. And you know, in a screenshot, you, when you get flat textures that look like that because it's in shadow, uh, we're just going to assume the worst because we're gamers. So exactly. yeah. Uh, yeah, game development is complicated, and the average person no. doesn't fully understand it. But you can't really expect them to fully understand it when you show something off. Like what you show off needs to kind of cater to. Uh, the wider understanding of it and people 
you know, don't understand dynamic lighting right now. So when you show, like you said, when you right. show off something that's flat, people are just going to say it looks bad. And mm -hmm. there's, and when you see that still image and you compare it to what Halo, people are comparing it to Halo Reach and Halo 3 saying it looked worse. Yeah, when you have those still images side by side, yeah, you can say it looks worse. Seeing the game in action is something completely different, but yeah, um, it'll right. be interesting. And, and there is going to be a serious learning curve for devs when it comes to making that pop, making that look great. Um, yeah, and, and no doubt it looks it looks better now from what they're showing. Uh, but also I think a, a big part of that is probably they know what to show now. Like, the, like they were showing GIFs of it, of the, of the dynamic lighting changing. And so you could see how it was shifting across the world and how realistic and, and like just lush the world looked. Uh, so, and that's not something they showed us before. So like that, that difference is just kind of, it might be just in the presentation almost and literally the, how they are presenting us the, the information. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Super chat hype from Faisal007. Since Tango games are under Xbox, what do we expect in terms of game quality from Akami as a developer with bigger budget? As with the, uh, do you have any expectations for Tango GameWorks? Uh, I I no I I don't know I'm kind of like um I, I want to see what's what's that game Tokyo uh, oh Ghostwire is it Ghostwire Tokyo Ghostwire Tokyo yeah yeah that sounds right um I, I I'm like I was never as hot on that one as other people uh and I, I didn't play the Evil Within games but I, I I'm interested to see how that game comes out I I think that um. I, I would just say, I would say like they're probably going to release Ghostwire Tokyo om almost as is and see how it does and then maybe that'll determine the future of of what like their next uh, game looks like. But like my, Microsoft isn't acquiring all these studios to like you know uh, to hamper any one of them. They're going to try to give them all the resources they need to get the most out of their games. Uh, so I, I guess I, I mean if what am I expecting in terms of quality? I expect it to be kind of in line with what we got with Evil Within and then maybe under Microsoft to maybe get a little bit more polish because that I think that's the, the goal here is give these studios enough resources to, to deliver on the best form of their product. I think that's why we see Psychonauts 2 delayed. I mean, they said as much. Um, and yeah, so uh, you know, I mean, hopefully it comes out and it's the best Tango Gameworks game ever, right? It's like even yeah. better than Evil Within, which a lot of people like. Like that's the, that would be my hope. And I think that should be the goal. And I think that should be the expectation. I think that all of these games coming out of these studios now under under Microsoft, um, we should expect the best from them. And because I, 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 Microsoft has the resources to make that happen. So, uh, and if it doesn't, it should be, I think I would find that a little disappointing uh, personally. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I feel exactly the same way. The, the, the first games that come out from these teams officially under the Xbox Game Studios banner, because we've, we've seen some releases where they've been pretty much done and it's been it's been released at like mid acquisition right. or just after, you know, the acquisition. But yeah, it still has like deals in place to go to like all these other consoles and stuff like that. Yeah. But the, the games that come out under Xbox Game Studios, I feel really need to be the best representations of these teams and their talent. And I'm sure that's yeah. what Xbox wants. Xbox wants to be able to show off this amazing stable of um, incredible developers. Um, and another cool thing about Xbox Game Studios is that they have this kind of culture of collaboration. So you have all these talented teams sharing their tools with each other. So you have this huge right. pool of people who can say, all right, Sea of Thieves, you have amazing water physics. Show us how this works. Um, and then they can, and Coalition. Coalition is like the premier multiplayer experts for that team. Uh, they are even helping with Halo Infinite at this point. So you right. have these talented, established teams who can come in and help these developers build these projects and fully flesh out these projects. So you you don't have something that's good, but rough around the edges. You have something that comes out of the gate in a really great, strong form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Chandler Weatherford asks, any chance of Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade on PC or Xbox? Uh, man, I hope, but I, I don't have my hopes too high, actually. Um, it, it would be nice. I, it seems like uh, of all of the deals that Sony made, um, the one for Final Fantasy with Square Enix seems like the one that is most locked down. And it seems like it was very future looking um, where it wasn't just, oh, let's get Final Fantasy VII Remake. It will help fund that. What else can we do here? Oh, we can we can include Final Fantasy 16 in this and and the future of Final Fantasy VII Remake and make these things you know, synonymous with PlayStation 5. Um, I, you know, you, you think these deals can never be for, forever, right? That's what we've seen. Like, like, like whenever you get an exclusive third party deal, it almost always expires eventually. 
And I imagine that's probably the same here. I just think it might be a little bit longer than we're expecting. And I think that just might be um, a part of Sony continuing to pay as more Final Fantasy games come out. Like, so now we're getting this remake Intergrade and eventually we'll get Final Fantasy 16 and then we'll get Final Fantasy 7 Remake Part 2. And maybe part of the deal is like, hey, we'll continue to support this stuff, but let's continue to keep this stuff exclusive. Um, and then once the deal has fully run its course, maybe we get it then. Uh, this is this is me kind of speculating a sort of worst case scenario for people who are on PC and Xbox. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, but, you know, I, I, we're not quite a year from the release date, right? It, it came out, when did it come out? In March uh, of last year, I think, April. like that, maybe summer. Mid, mid April. April, yeah. April. April. So let's get to let's get to a year out. Let's get to April and see what Square Enix is saying. If they're quiet about this and they still aren't talking about other platforms, then maybe we are going to have to wait. And if we get to E3 and they're like, oh, okay, and part of Microsoft's presentation is, and now it's coming to Game Pass or whatever, um, then we'll know. Uh, but yeah, but right now I'm I am sort of leading toward uh, not getting my hopes up that it's going to come to PC or Xbox anytime soon. Yeah, it's one of those. There was the speculation when it was first announced that it was like a, a year exclusivity deal. Right. I don't think that was ever of made official by anyone. I don't think there's any official mm. documentation to state that. But a lot of the insider speculation has been that it's they have to be quiet for a year, the full year. They can't talk about any other platforms. So I think, yeah, if we don't hear anything by mid April 16th, I want to say is when the, the game was pushed to, um, then it might be a, a little bit. A little bit longer before it comes to Xbox. Mm. Um, I've also heard talks that they worked out weird two-year agreements on Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy XVI so that they have exclusivity on those games for two years. But again, I don't have any data to suggest that that's actually right. the case. Yeah, I, I, mean, I just wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if it's longer than what we are used to. Uh, and very specifically because that sony wants to treat final fantasy like a playstation exclusive thing through the through much of this generation so you know it worked it worked out well for them before i i don't know if it necessarily is going to be worth what they're paying because like we saw final fantasy 7 remake on playstation 4 kind of sold okay but not super great um but you know maybe that's just because it was the remake and once we get the final fantasy 16 that will really pop off and this will start paying dividends and having on, on uh, playstation plus well i mean and that's yeah it's on playstation plus right so there's there's a big integrated deal here between these two companies that is going to maybe continue for quite some time now yeah. sony is yeah very invested in making sure that everyone knows that final fantasy is synonymous with playstation for the longest time that was the case um mm -hmm. ps1 ps2 final fantasy was a playstation game that's just what it was that was the reality it was never a first party thing but final fantasy was synonymous with playstation they are obviously working to get yep. that back and you know we can go back and forth on whether or not that Final Fantasy has the same value than it had before. Because to your point, Final Fantasy VII, in terms of hype on the internet, was a megaton, massive. People were losing their minds over that. Huge. But yeah. then we look at sales numbers, and it's it did well. But yeah, I'm, okay. I'm sure compared to the the hype that we saw, it it didn't match. The sales did not match the energy online. Right. I mean, like, you know, Animal, the Animal Crossing series started a, a few years after Final Fantasy VII, right? On the, around the same time, if you like, look at the Japanese release. Um, and now we've had a lot of Animal Crossing games, and the most recent one is selling 30, 30 million plus copies. And we get 5 million copies for Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's um, and on, a, on a console that has a larger install base. So, mm -hmm. like, if you're looking at attach rate percentage, it's, it's significantly lower. Um, and it, it's, I, I don't think this means like, oh, Final Fantasy is not, not dead. I just think no. that it, it, maybe it needs some tender, loving care, and Sony intends to give it that, and it's going to help it grow. And and one of the big ways to do that is to put a game like Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII Remake on PlayStation Plus. And um, now they're screaming and fighting. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, <it's all> um, <laughs> and, uh, and it, yeah, and like... So, like slowly build up the excitement for Final Fantasy Final Fantasy as a, as a you know series to the point where when Final Fantasy 16 comes out there is a lot of hype for it and then when Final Fantasy 7 Remake Part 2 comes out a lot of people have played the first part cuz they had it on game or on PlayStation Plus and now they're ready to go so um it, it, just cuz it's not Animal Crossing doesn't mean it's not going to be worth it it's just uh uh, you know, if they are building this relationship, they might have to get serious about it and really focus on it. And maybe a big part of that is making sure it's not on other platforms. Yeah, they, they really need to figure out what is going to make Final Fantasy the RPG franchise that they want it to be. Because again, right. 
Everyone wants Nintendo sales. Nintendo has this incredible power of selling exclusives and numbers that nobody can come close to. No, not even yep. the biggest PlayStation games are selling half as much as something like Animal Crossing, which is wild because I don't, I don't have data to, to show this, but I am certain that Animal Crossing cost so much less to make than The Last of Us. Yeah. Like Nintendo yes. has a very streamlined development production cost and they just sell copies on copies on copies. And, you know, we have Xbox and PlayStation that are making arguably bigger games, but they're not selling as well. They're not selling even a quarter most of the time. So it's, it's very interesting that, you know, we have those deals like Sony investing in Final Fantasy and trying to make it, you know, as worthwhile as something like an Animal Crossing. But yeah, can't, yeah, and it, it, it should it should pan out for them pretty well, I think. Still, like at least at least it'll make a huge splash during their big presentations, right? During during their E three thing, that's that's a thing that'll get a huge pop, and that has a lot of value to them. Um, you know, because we see what happens when when there's not something super hype during a, a state of play, um, and so they're they're going to want to continue feeding that because that works out for them. It helps them win sort of the mind the mind and um, you know the, the hearts and minds sort of battle. That happens where you kind of want to give your fans something to go argue about on message boards and say, hey, here's what here's what's in our corner. And that has worked out well for Sony and Final Fantasy is definitely a feather in that cap. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, RA89 with a super chat saying Project Athia is a two year deal. So that's something um, yeah. a few other people are saying that as well. Again, I don't do you know if that's officially confirmed? I've heard that, but. I, I don't know for sure, but it, it, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. But it's, yeah, people, multiple people are saying it. I'll see if that's going around or if that's confirmed for sure. But uh, yeah, I, I may, maybe that's the kind of money that Sony was just throwing around to start out this generation is two year deals. And uh, yeah, that might, if it, I feel like that might be the happy medium for them, right? Like we're not going to pay for actually ultimate exclusivity, but let's do, let's butter you up a little bit more than normal and really make it worth your while. Um, and I think, yeah, Square Enix was probably clearly happy they did that because, you know, I think having a, having a, a company give you a lot of money up front is always going to be a nice, sure thing that they're going to take to the bank. It gives you comfort as a developer, because that's something yeah. we hear about with a lot of developers is they're just scared of the risks of, of making a game. And when you have like, you know, Sony come to you or you have Xbox come to you with Game Pass and say, all right, we want this. Here is this safety net. No matter what happens in terms of sales right. for your game, no matter you know how it's received, you are not going to completely go bankrupt if this if this does not pan out for you. We are going to make sure that you have a a pool of money. And I'm sure as a developer who I'm sure cares about your team and wants to make sure that you're not in a situation where you need to lay people off because the game that they spent years of their life on didn't do well. I'm sure stuff right. like that is very very enticing. So. We know Sony is not afraid to throw huge amounts of money for exclusive. That is something that they are just pretty loud and proud about. So right, especially to, especially to kick off this generation. Yes, they're they're definitely doing it more than ever. So two year exclusivity would be interesting. It would be kind of a you know an expansion of the norm, but yeah, definitely not outside the the realm of possibility, right. especially when it comes to PlayStation trying to get certain games synonymous with the brand. We saw it with Destiny yep. as well. The game wasn't even exclusive. The PlayStation, but you had a general audience who thought it was a PlayStation exclusive title because of how much it was marketed and because of the exclusive content that was kind of tied into that. Yep, definitely. So we're getting towards the tail end of the show here. So I guess I want to talk to you a little bit about how it feels to be a, a personality on the internet who can say yeah. benign things on a podcast <laughs> or on Twitter that are then presented as leaks or facts online. I, I'll, I'll point to your, uh, your Bethesda, uh, your Bethesda leak, if you will. You were on a podcast and you talked about how you thought Xbox was gonna do a Bethesda event in March. The next day on YouTube, I saw probably 20 videos that said there was Jeez. a Bethesda leak confirmed for March. And then I look at the source and it's a line that you said in a podcast. <laughs> so how does that feel? Is it annoying? Is it hilarious? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it, it's a little stressful because I'm not, um, I'm not the best at like regulating my thoughts and, and between my brain and my mouth to the point where, okay, let's, uh, let's word this in the best way possible. That so, so that feels like lawyerly that people will be like, okay, this is exactly what he said and exactly what he meant. Um, and so, uh, there's always like these room, lots of room for gaps and gray area, gray areas for people to fill in. And then 
sort of take it and run with it. Um, and it's it, and so I'm a little bit more used to this happening now, and I try to be a little bit more careful, but it still happens so often that it's like, man, it's it really is kind of anything I say, and I I, I think eventually that'll. Uh, you know, I, I feel like the flavor of the month right now, and eventually that'll pass. But for now, it's like, okay, let's just deal with it. And it is, um, I guess I'm trying to keep a good sense of humor about it and mostly think of it as pretty funny. Like, it's mostly funny. Um, yeah, people are, people are just trying to make content on the, on the internet a lot of times. Um, people are just trying to, uh, you know, get conversations going with their audiences. And they're look, looking for, you know, any way to do that. And sometimes if it comes down to a line I said on a podcast, Okay. Uh, and it hasn't gotten too out of hand anytime recently. Um, I guess, except for like the Elden Ring fans are, are pretty wild, but I, I, I don't, I also think that's mostly just kind of funny, right? They're, they're just, they're just really into their, their game. I get it for sure. So it's kind of like where I'm at right now. I try to keep a good sense of humor about it. Yeah. And I think generally speaking, the people who are kind of feeding into this are just having fun with it because, because of the memes, yes. especially the, the, the Elden Ring fandom. You and Jeff Keeley, no matter what you post on Twitter, you're just getting spammed with Elden Ring talk. And it's it's so funny because people know that you and Jeff, you've been in the industry for a while. You, you talk to people, you have certain information. So they are looking to, at you two to be the shepherds of all Elden Ring information. Because From Software yeah. is not giving, the, giving it to them, you have to be the one, Jeff. You have to carry the torch. You have to leak the Elden Ring information is, is kind mm. of the contingent online. And it, it's super funny. It's really funny to me to see. Um, and I'm glad you're having fun with it because, yeah, the video games are fun. And I don't think anyone yep. is, especially with the Elden Ring stuff, being that serious. We all, a lot of us love From Software. From Software is very important to a lot of people. And that's why they want to hear more but um, how did this all start for you when it comes to the, the cult of Elden Ring? Was it really just the one tweet about you saying you were optimistic about Elden Ring? Is that really the, the catalyst for the obsession? It, it, it might have been. I have like a poor memory for this stuff. It all sort of melts together. Um, I think that, yeah, I think so. Like, cause I, I think there was um, some event coming up and I might've had some, some information about it. And um I, I think I heard like just kind of secondhand almost from a from a source that uh, uh, you know it, it might be coming soon. It might like it like the like they they, they it stuff it something had changed and they expected to hear about it soon. I'm like oh, okay, well I guess I'm going to be optimistic about Elden Ring then. And then yeah, things kind of got out of hand from there. And then I looked into it a little bit more, and then it was like the next day I was like I am pessimistic about <laughs> Elden Ring because I knew it, now it wasn't going to be at this whatever event was coming up. Um, and so then it's like, yeah, but then yeah, they, they probably were like, OK, well, everything he says, we're going to be tracking now. And I'm like, OK, well, let me look in and see what's actually kind of happening with this. And since then, I've gotten, uh, you know, some more information and nothing, nothing has changed my sort of outlook of, of, about what's happening with that game. And it, like when I start saying, you know, um, probably by the end of March, um, and that was you know based on a few things. But like I've said a bunch of times, it's not, nothing too solid. Um or nothing like we're, we're with a solid date. And so it's like, but they still like, yeah, they're, they're certain this is exactly what it means. They, they, you know, they still bother me all the time, not bother me, but they're still are constantly, you know, bugging me for more information on my discord, in my DMS on Twitter. Um, and if I, whenever I check out the subreddit, a lot of times there are just Jeff Grubb memes and it's like, Oh man, okay, this is pretty wild. And it's like, <laughs> um, th there's, there's a lot of information about Elden Ring that we just like, we just can't share. Like I'm not authorized to share all of it. I, I but uh, I, like I get like these people are excited and I'm like, okay, I wish I could just tell you everything I know and everything that I've seen. And it's like, I would just give it to you guys. I wish I could, but I'm, I'm not going to like betray my, the, like the agreements I've made. So it's like, let's just, let's just see this through together and hopefully it works out like how we all hope it works out. And we do see it soon. Um, I think there's like some, some smoke. And so I'm expecting some fire from it soon. Um, but you just, you never know. And I'm like, my, I'm dreading the idea that if things, if something does go wrong and the game does get pushed for some reason, which is still possible people, please, it's still possible that that could happen. I am dreading what that would be like. And I hope that people, um, yeah, I, I know there will be some people that just take it too hard and will take and will say, "Oh, I I lied to them," and I um, I you know, I just sort of have to like live with that part of it, where it's like I I try to be very clear about what I know and what I don't, and I tried and I also want you guys to have some information because I see how desperate you are for it. If I have it, I want to share what I can. Um, 
But then when that gets turned into like a certainty and to a prophecy, um, when that, if it doesn't work out, it's going to be, it's going to like, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'll have to deal with the fallout and that's fine. And if people don't trust me after that, that's my own making. I totally will accept that. So uh, mostly I'm just like, Hey, from let's just get it out there. Come on. Let's, let's just do this. Give people let's just do this. five seconds of a gameplay, please. Just yeah. to settle <laughs> things down. It doesn't need to be anything crazy. Just give us a teaser, please. Yep. Just for the sake of the internet. Cause yeah, it is, it's ravenous. The, 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 the need for Elden Ring information is unlike anything that I have ever seen online before. And mm -hmm. a lot of it just comes from the notoriety that from software has built up at this point. They, they've always had a cult following, but with every single release, that, that cult expands and grows, and the desire to have the next big FromSoft Souls-like grows. Um, but again, I think with Elden Ring in particular, um, I think the work-from-home situation has delayed them showing stuff and definitely delayed the release. I'm sure initially the, the, the window that they were targeting was, was probably sooner than, than it is now, a lot sooner. So... You, like you said, this could be something that gets pushed a bit. This could be something that we get a one of those kind of depressing development updates this year that says, hey, we understand you were looking forward to Elden Ring, and we just want to let you know that the team is hard at work on Elden Ring, and we are looking forward to giving you more information on Elden Ring at a future date, and then the, that's it. There is a, yeah. there is a world where that's, that's a possibility this year right yeah and and like I, I i yeah i've never said anything about a release date for this game or like when like I, at least i don't think i have um I, I expect us to hear about it like sometime soon mm -hmm. um and the way you just put it like yeah where like it could just that could come with some some bad news as well uh and i, I know people would be disappointed but I, I want people to sort of brace themselves for that possibility where um yeah, where even if we do hear about this game, it might come with, hey, uh, also, uh, COVID wrecked our shit, guys. Uh, we, we, we're, we're messed up here. Uh, that, that could be something that we hear. We don't know for sure if that's, if that's the case, but that could be something that they, they, they say. But we, just, we don't know necessarily what's going on with, with From's development. So, um, you know, and, and some of the things we have, you know, there's a lot of places where the, the information could be coming from, not just from like there's they're working with Bandai Namco. Um, the, you know, they're, they are definitely trying to get a marketing deal. We don't know if that's with Xbox now, but but like that stuff. So there there are conversations happening. So there's a lot of points for stuff to come out. But um, whether or not what's going on necessarily inside of from right now is not necessarily widely known. So we'll have to kind of wait and see, wait for them to come out and tell us what's happening. And. Yeah, it's it's stressful. I know, like having a lot of people like looking to me for answers is is a, it's a lot of stress. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it's it's also the job, so you kind of just kind of take it for what it is. And if things don't go exactly how people are hoping for, I'll just have to I'll have to live with that, and we'll see. We'll and I I probably, I probably end up doing it again with the next from game, so we'll see. I I really hope people you know are understanding of the the hurdles of COVID development. This has been something that's said by a ton of people, but the realities are that it is really hard for some teams to kind of adjust to this work from home situation. And so at the end of the day, video games should be fun. And I don't ever want to put a developer in a situation where they are tasked with risking their lives and their safety to make a video game for people to play. Like video games are fun. El El Elden yep. Ring at some point when it comes out is going to be fun. So let's not make yes. <laughs> the the build up to it just awful and miserable for and, everyone involved. And, I, and the real, reality is that everyone is also dealing with COVID. So a lot of people are stuck at home and, and they're not connecting with people in traditional ways. And so they are going online and connecting with people over stuff like looking forward to Elden Ring. And, you know, we, that is expressed through these memes and through the, throughout, you know, these collective jokes that they have on their subreddits and, and elsewhere. And we've seen this all over. Like I think that was part of what happened with, uh, you know, GameStop and, and, and the stock trading there is, you know, the, the wall street bets, just, they were creating their own community and culture connecting with one another because a lot of that stuff is lacking elsewhere in our lives right now. And so um, like, I, I'm not gonna, like, I'm not even like holding people like, necessarily responsible for for like getting a little bit crazy about this game we are all kind of getting crazy about stuff in our lives we're looking for any sort of connection and if this game if looking forward to this game with a bunch of other people provides you comfort eh, lean into that that's fine lean mm -hmm. into that just 
if 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 things go wrong with development if if the game doesn't come along the way that you exactly want just remember that there's people on the other side of that going through the same thing and trying to try uh, and that fully understand your anticipation and and want to try to meet it as best they can and if they're not it's not due to lack of trying and it's not because they want, wanted to hurt your feelings or anything like that they want to get this game out to you yeah absolutely they i'm sure they are working very hard to get something out i'm there's no way that they don't understand that the desire from the fandom to see what this game is and i think that's where a lot of the kind of ravenous fandom is at right now is nobody officially knows what this game is there's been a lot yeah. of like you know people who've historically leaked from software stuff in the past giving out little bits and pieces of a, of what the gameplay could be but from an official standpoint from from software we've gotten one teaser trailer that was cryptic as hell it if you watch that teaser trailer you don't have any idea what that game is going to be we can assume based on what from software has made in the past um but generally speaking the average person officially has no idea what elden ring is outside of it mm -hmm. it's a from software game yeah i yeah you could it could look it could look like a lot like a dark souls game it could you know there could be it could be like more even more open world it could be all kinds of stuff like we, we just we have no idea and it's like uh we, we haven't even reached that that sort of that point of the, the the hype cycle where uh they do tell us stuff and then people get to have anxiety about whether or not this game is going to match exactly what they thought it was going to be in their heads oh, yeah um, so yeah, yeah that's the next step in this phase so yeah i'm looking forward to that looking forward to that for sure uh super yeah. chat from true gamer not claiming to be an insider but i spoke with someone very important at xbox last week and he sounded like they would be at e3 all i'll say winky face true gamer yeah the true insider yeah, maybe yeah that so everyone uh, give your give your uh, twitter account let everybody come and ask you about this stuff yeah true gamer uh, drop it in there so we can you can just get blasted with elden ring dms yeah. <laughs> uh yeah it's, it's it is possible that they go with e3 maybe e3 in the usa are have given them a better deal or maybe they got their shit together and microsoft is impressed um that that's all possible it's just based on what we know and then based on a little bit on what i heard i was expecting them to go rogue that's that's that was what i heard but that was a few weeks ago if you've talked to someone more recently then then maybe maybe there's something there and one more super chat from True Gamer. With Konami willing to outsource now, what about Xbox funding a new Metal Gear developed by Kojima Productions? Possible. We talked about this a little bit previously. A little bit, yeah. But we're kind of, seems like we're both on the same page that we don't really see Kojima be... wanting to do a Metal Gear. I, I or maybe, mean, not, uh, maybe not wanting is the right word, but. You, you know, with Ko Kojima, it's always, oh, uh, this is my last Metal Gear game, uh, so I'm never going to make another one again. And then, the, then he makes four more or whatever. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm like, it's hard to gauge his interest in, in that sort of thing. But uh, his interest in working with Konami, I think, is kind of your point. And I think I agree with that, that he probably wouldn't. If there was a lot of involvement from Konami, he wouldn't want to do that. Um, but I, I'll never say never. These things cool off over time. Eventually, cooler heads prevail. Mm -hmm. If everyone involved feels like they need a hit and they need Metal Gear Solid to accomplish that, um, money talks and things will eventually, and money will talk eventually to the point where they go patch over those burnt bridges and stuff like that. So, uh, but that, you know, I don't think it's, I feel like it's probably still too soon to go to that card, right? They're not going to draw that one yet. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Like maybe, yeah, maybe at some point you never know what the future looks like. I always use bands as an example. You have these people in bands for years who break up, just have the ugly breakup and talk about how they'll never work together again. And then 10, 15 yes. years later, reunion tour, let's go. Comeback album. So maybe yes, 10 years right. from now, we'll get the uh, Metal Gear Solid Kojima comeback tour. Yep. <laughs> I, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens eventually. It's just, you're right. It's, it's a little, the, the wound's a little bit too fresh. Bands don't get to back together this quickly, right? They, it, it takes some time. They got to do a few solo projects, you know, get the yes, art exactly. out of This is my most ambitious project ever. I finally get to, you know, express my voice as a creator. Yes. I, I, he's got to try, it's got to do with the Michael Jordan thing too, right? He's like, he's got to go try to play baseball. He's going to go try to make movies. Yeah. And they, they'll do a little bit of that and that'll probably not work out quite as well as games. Um, or maybe he'll make an awesome production studio that makes movies, but eventually he'll come back to games uh, even after that. And then at that point, I could see him being like, all right, 
now it's time to really wrap up Metal Gear Solid for real this time. Real. And everyone's like, what do you mean? It wasn't even wrapped up. Like, no, there's still things that I need to say and, and <laughs> that I'm, people will lose their minds and I'll be right there with them because uh -huh. even I, I like Metal Gear Solid 5 and 1 probably the best. I'm not the biggest Metal Gear Solid fan, but of the Metal Gear Solid like marketing and lead up, I am the biggest fan. I love every single thing he's ever done talking about those games, every trailer. It's all so good. So yeah, I would love that to come back. Yeah, that would be a, a big, it'd be like, you know, the Motley crew come back. We're, we're coming back once. Grand finale. Let's go. Yes. We're going out with the bang. Yeah. And then hopefully it's not like, you know, like Motley crew two years later being, okay, we're going to, we're actually, we're doing it again. We're going to, we, yep. the last one did really well. So we are actually going to do another Metal Gear. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, we've been going for about two hours now, so I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping it up. Um, huge thanks. It was, it's been awesome to sit yeah. and chat with you. Um, a lot of awesome conversations, lots of good stuff. Um, didn't juice you too much for deets, but I appreciate you uh, relinquishing or at least talking about Elden Ring in some capacity. Because I know that's how many DMs a day do you get about Elden Ring? I don't even count anymore. <laughs> and it's it's everywhere. It's in, in the Discord. It's on. It's in DMs. There's some emails uh, here and there, stuff like that. I don't. No one's texted me about it or anything like that, but I feel like that's always something. I someone definitely was like, "Here's a number to someone at Bandai Namco in Japan or something like that." I'm like, "Oh, maybe, maybe. Uh, maybe. I'm not probably not going to call this Probably's, person." Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Jeff. You might know me from yeah. Twitter, but I'm looking to get details on Elder. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I and I get it. I appreciate that the help whenever people are trying to help, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to necessarily do that. Um, but, but but yeah, it's it's a lot. But I, I, I like I still like talking about it. And I and like I, I don't want to like, you know, I did like a like in the title of our podcast this week. I was like, there's a, here's an Elden Ring update. Let's talk about it a little bit. Like, I'm not I don't want to try to run away from it or or just shut up, shut down the conversation. Um, I just I, it's just very difficult to be precise in language to the point where people fully understand. I am not trying to be coy with you. I am not trying to act like i know more than i do um there, there's some stuff i just can't talk about and I, I won't talk about that and then there's here's what i can and i'll try to say that in precisely the way i can uh, and then it still sort of never works out that way uh but it's, it hasn't backfired yet to the point where it's like oh i never ever want to be involved with that again um i just yeah again Let's just brace ourselves for the worst people and then if the best happens that'll be nice we're all in this together guys we're gonna we're make it through together, yep um, cool. So where can people find you? I know I'm sure most people in here know already, but, um, anything you want to plug or just where can people find you on Twitter if they want to hit you up about. Yeah. The best way to, the best way to follow me is just Twitter, J uh, Jeff Grubb on Twitter. And then, uh, we do our own uh, podcast on games beat games beat decides every Friday afternoon ish, uh, around, you know, I'm on the, you know, I'm on the podcast, right? You, she just wants to be on the podcast too. Oh, guest yeah. appearance. Are we? <laughs> Uh, she's on the other side gate. No, I, I just good uh, games. We decides look it up on YouTube. Uh, it's on my, my channel, youtube.com slash Jeffrey grub. Uh, go ahead and give us a watch every Friday. It'd be, be nice. To come hang out with us. It's a lot like this. Just having cool conversations about games. Cool. No, it, it's awesome, man. I, again, I really appreciate you taking some time. I, had a lot of fun. So thanks to the hundreds of people hanging out. Um, if you guys are new, if this is your first time watching, go ahead and like subscribe. Um, this is part of windows central gaming. This is, I guess our official gaming podcast that we do every Saturday live. Um, next week, we're going to be joined with joined by the, the hype master himself, Snowbike Mike. So I'm pretty excited about that. Super fun. dude. Oh, Mike's a good boy. Yeah. Su super cool, dude. Really excited about getting him on. So to catch us next week for Snowbike Mike, and then whatever madness will happen next week. And, um, yeah, I'll something catch I'm sure. Yeah. So again, thanks for watching, guys, and we'll uh, we'll see you around. Bye. Bye.